Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Seeing that the appointed time has arrived and that we have quorum, the chair opens up the Wednesday, December 21st, 2022 meeting of the Mashby Planning Board being held here in McCoyet Meeting Room at Mashby Town Hall, 16 Great Neck Road North, Mashby, Massachusetts. I'd like to welcome everybody here today. We're being broadcast live on local channel 18 and streamed live on the town of website, uh, town of Mashby website, www.mashbyma.gov backslash channel uh, dash 18. Um, I'd like to uh, let you know that we're being videographed and recorded tonight. Um, we do have an opportunity for people to sign up for public comment. Um, we do have two public hearings. One starts at 710 on, um, that's regarding 532 Main Street. Um, the next two are regarding 20 Tudor Terrace, and that's they start at 720 and 720, 725, respectively. Um, so if you're here for those, either of those matters, please hold your comments until that time. Um, everybody will be heard tonight. Um, um, that's all I'll say about that right now. Um, so I'd like to start uh, by asking you to rise and join with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. So while we wait for our 710 public hearing, the board's going to do a couple of business items. We have a set of minutes from December 9th, 2022 that um, I reviewed. I didn't have any uh, comments or edits. Did anybody have any comments or edits? Seeing none, I'd accept a motion to approve the minutes of December 9th, 2022 as presented. So be. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any abstentions? I'm going to abstain. Jo John abstains. Anybody against? Okay. Um, next thing I'd like to do is under new business <clears throat> in our in our packet there is a schedule of meeting dates for 2023. We normally meet on the first and third Wednesday of the month. Um, looks like you did it right, 2023. Um, any holidays? I, I don't have it directly in front of me. Okay. Um, generally, in the month of September, when the Jewish high holidays are approaching, it often falls on a Wednesday night. So if there's a proposed date on a Jewish high holiday, I've generally proposed canceling that date and scheduling a meeting ad hoc if necessary. If it's not indicated on that, I don't think we would fall in conflict with any of the uh, high holidays. Okay. So anybody else have any comments? If not, I'd accept a motion to accept the proposed meeting schedule for the planning board in 2023. Move. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any abstentions or against? Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few minutes. I'm going to go to um, town plan and reports. So whatever, whatever item uh, you want to start with, go right ahead. Uh, because you asked and because Ed's on the line, I, I wanted to, uh, I'm going to go to the, the third bullet on the agenda relative to New Seabury. Cottages phase three, you'll see under the correspondence as well, my office received uh, a letter from a gentleman named Mike Milbury, who is the uh, president, I believe, the, of the Homeowners Association, who is positioned to take control of the maintenance uh, of the roadway systems in the phase three of the cottages. Um, they had contacted me because a number of the uh, homes constructed have experienced flooding issues. So they've contracted with a third party consultant to evaluate the current situation. Um, and before the Homeowners Association want, wanted to assume liability of those road, roadway facilities, they wanted to ensure that the construction of the roadway and the infrastructure was done adequately and in accordance with the approved plans. Uh, the reason I wanted to raise this is uh, in your packets is the report from the uh, from the Mr. Milbury's consultants and the, the folks who live in Phase Three's consultants, um, mostly indicating to me uh, grade issues, particularly around the foundations of the home. Um, what I have indicated to Mr. Milbury, uh, what I would be recommending to you, is that we authorize that the board authorize Ed 
uh, to review the existing conditions of the site and determine whether or not there are, are any uh, construction related issues or grading issues that pertain specifically to the roadway and stormwater infrastructure that you've approved. Uh, to note that Charlie Rowley did inspect all of these facilities and, the, and uh, has, we've released funds being held in security for the adequate completion of those roads. Um, so I wanna confirm, I would suggest that we have Ed confirm that the construction remains consistent with the original approval. Um, and it's my suspicion that the grading issues that are currently causing flooding issues for some of these homes, not all, but if some, but some of the residents are concerned that they're next. Um, the report indicates that the grading around the foundation must be a minimum of six, must show a minimum of six inches of, of concrete. So I do believe that this is probably a building code related issue enforceable by the building commissioner. Um, but out of an abundance of, ca of caution for the homeowners association, it would be my recommendation the board authorize Ed to investigate uh, the current situation. The board still is holding security for the completion of the subdivision of about $175,000 um, for various improvements that are generally pertain to landscaping and things like that, not necessarily the installation of any utilities or stormwater infrastructure. Um, but that is my recommendation to, to coordinate with Ed and my department to investigate the current situation and to uh, offer Mr. Mirabilleri and the Homeowners Association um, a response from the board. I, I went up, I grew up there a lot. The last two big rainstorms, I was gonna bring up last meeting. There's something wrong up there because it's not training right. And they don't have enough catch bases too. There's some areas, there's no catch bases for, you know, I had a feet this way and then a feet that way and it's all going into the, you know, where the houses are. Right. And you don't get the houses and they're right on the dirt, yeah. you know. So, but that's funny, I was gonna bring that up. And so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I am not 100% familiar with the existing conditions on the ground, only what Mr. Milbury has reported to my office. Um, recommendation is unchanged, though. I, I, would, I would recommend Ed uh, yeah, work with my definitely. office. I would note, though, that I also haven't been in contact with Bayswater Development on this particular issue. I, I do know Mr. Milbury is. Um, it would be prudent, in my opinion, to if Ed is to be involved alongside my office and Mr. Milbury, that we notify Bayswater of the investigation as well. Uh, so just... Bayswater have something in here? Bayswater does not. Okay. And, and they are the construction company? They are the developer of phase three of the cottages, okay. yes. All right. Is this is another new business? We still under? Yes. Uh, this Kenny Marson's property, people live in there now, but they've got the entrances, but there's, they need some lines to say, you no know, arrow point, you go this way, and arrow point in this way, are you referring to Country Club Lane, Dennis? Yeah, Country Yeah, the, uh, we've met with Ken Marsters, we being uh, Ed, myself, and the DPW director to evaluate uh, that intersection. So work is underway on that. And then he kept on, he kept that road all the way now. It's a long road, yes. He don't have to come back to the plan board? He does need to come back from the board because the only, uh, there, uh, Mr. Marsters is building out that subdivision in, in various phases. He's currently in phase one. You've only released about a third of the lots from the covenant. So he's preparing uh, to request a release for the second phase, and he's been working with Ed to uh, be prepared for that request. All right. So, um, regarding the cottages, if I, I, I want to send Ed out, who would pay for the bill? Uh, the town would pay for the bill. Okay. So, um, do we have kind of like a, a, a proposed budget for this work? Uh, I've discussed this with the town manager, and he's. Uh, uh, if, if necessary, we would re we would, would be able to request a, a transfer of funds to cover the cost for Ed prior to the end of the fiscal year. So do you, I think we should come up with a number right now. Do we want to say three thousand, five thousand? Um, Ed, what do you what do you how much do you think it will? What kind of budget should we ask from the town manager's office? Okay, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, this is the first I've heard of this whole whole issue. Um, it sounds like there needs to be an inspection, just from my listening. I, I was half listening at the beginning because I was talking about New Seabury. I thought it was something else. And then when I heard Evan say, I think we should have it look at it, okay, great. So now this is phase three. I've been inspecting phase four, as you all know. Um, and uh, I've never stepped foot on phase three. So I would need to take a look at that, take a look at the plans, and make a recommendation. Then we probably need to come to a, a, have the uh, applicant or the owners or the developer, I should say, come to a meeting, 
So I'd say 3,000 is enough, certainly, to start. Okay. I don't think it'll be much more than that. Um, but depend, depends on what's going to be, what the scope of work is. Right now, it sounds like an inspection, uh, a meeting either uh, outside of the, the hearing, um, which I think would be good, a work session with the, with the owner, um, developer, and then um, recommendation letter and, and attending at a public hearing. So I would say that you know, 3,000 is, is reasonable at this point. Okay, so I'd accept a motion that uh, we request a budget of three thousand dollars from the town manager's office, and um, to cover any expenses uh, from our engineer going out to examine this um, issue, and also to authorize our engineer and our town planner uh, to uh, look into this issue and suggest solutions to the problem. So be. Second. 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 Any discussion? Uh, I don't think it's going to be more than two or three thousand because, Ed, you could go out there and just look at it, see how it's great. You know, I mean, I drive by there and I'm looking at it and I notice that. You know, it's it's really noticeable. So three thousand, you okay. think is a good I, budget? I, just, yeah, I, I mean, just a, I just don't want him to have to have come back all the time. <clears throat> we just need to talk to, to Evan and go over it, and uh, we'll get out there. Yeah. So, so that I understand, I've looked at these pictures and I see all these grading problems are serious, well, look pretty serious to me. They'll be digging up some lawns, they're going to be digging up some pavements. But this is not what, is this what Ed will be doing? Ultimately, what I think Ed needs to, what I, what I think Ed needs to focus on is the, the, the road and the infra infrastructure that you have approved. Right. If, it's, right. if the road and the infrastructure that you've approved of that subdivision is not contributing to the flooding issue, and it's a code, building code related issue relative to the regrading around the foundation, yeah. um, then it, we would refer this particular issue to the building commissioner and it wouldn't be enforceable under the subdivision control law. Okay. Great. Great, thank you. Okay. okay, so seeing that the appointed time uh, has arrived, um, and we voted, right? Did we yep. vote? Yep. No. I think we did. You okay, vote, no. all in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed, abstaining? Okay, thank you. Um, and Cameron, you're all set? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing that the appointed time has arrived, the chair opens up the 710 public hearing. The applicant is Marcello Meleni at uh, Forest Road, LLC. The location is 532 Main Street, Assessor's Map 26 Block 6. The applicant requests consideration for approval of a nine lot definitive subdivision plan of land consisting of approximately 18.05 acres located on Main Street, Route 130, between Nicoletta's Way and Echo Road. Pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 41, Section 81T, and the Mashpee Rules and Regulations governing the subdivision of land, the Mashpee Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Wednesday, April 6, 2022, at 7, 10 p.m. in the required room of Mashpee Town Hall, 16 Great Neck Road North. So that, that public hearing was continued to today. Okay. To consider an application by Marcello Melenni Mag of 80 Airport Road, Hyannis, Mass, 02601, for approval of a nine-lot definitive subdivision plan of land consisting of approximately 18.05 acres located on Main Street, Route 130, between Nicoletta's Way and Echo Road, and identified on the Mashpee Assessor's Map as Assessor's Map 26, Block 6, this lot proposed for subdivision is within the C1 Limited Commercial District, the I1 Industrial District, and the R5 Residential District. Okay? The plans may be reviewed in the offices of the town clerk or town planner at Mashpee Town Hall. And when this was posted, John Fallon was chair the Mashpee Planning Board, and the original publication dates were March 11th, 2022, and March 18th, 2022. So um, I know that Evan has uh, some comments for us, but I'd like to recognize the project proponent uh, and give him the floor first to Thank see you. Uh, what's going on. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, for the record, Attorney Christopher Corain representing the applicant, Marcello Malegni, uh, Forestdale Road, LLC. Um, there are two matters that I'd like to address tonight. I know Evan's going to speak to one of them, um, at least. But the first one is, I think, um, the sim more of a simple one. I know there was a comment um, made by the public regarding uh, Section 17440, dealing with the 200 feet requirement. 
Um, and so Evan asked me to look into it because there is an exception to that bylaw that if the lot was created before 1996, you don't need to meet that 200, you just need to meet the maximal, uh, maximum feasible. Um, so this lot, I, I provided Evan the information, this lot I think was, I don't have it in front of me, but it was created well before 1996, so it would fall under that exception uh, to 174.40. You know what? I'm going to get you a copy of that plan so that you can read off. Yep. Here, why don't you take it from me so you can read off into the record uh, when when you're saying the law was created. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so before me, I have the uh, the plan of land that was recorded at the Barnstable County Registry of Deeds at uh, Plan Book 272. Two, page 49, um, and then the lot was, uh, if I can read this, I can read it. What, 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 do you, what, what are you interpreting that number as? Uh, it's a January 1973, I'm uncertain of the exact day, but January 73. Right, and it was uh, signed off by the uh, Charles M. Savory, who was the uh, the uh, the surveyor at that time. Can you read the book and page yes. of that plan so people can look up in the registry sure. deeds? Uh, plan book 272, page 49. Okay. So, so again, as that lot was created prior to 1996, it would fall into that exception. I need the page back. <laughs> and Evan, you have that in your office. I do. If people want it, okay. All right, go ahead. Thank you. Thank so you. I, I just wanted to, to bring the board up to speed on that matter because I know it was a uh, uh, it was brought up at the public meeting. Uh, the second matter is, of course, the uh, the traffic study. Uh, so at the last meeting, the um, uh, Evan had uh, provided the board with a few um, uh, proposals uh, from various. Uh, traffic studies, I think there was maybe one still outstanding that he needed to get, but um, the board at that time had approved, uh, you know, they want the, obviously the board wants the traffic study to be done. Um, and then my reading of the rule, the subdivision rules and regulations uh, would require the board to select the specific um, traffic study engineer. So my applicant has asked whether or not the board would entertain uh, having his consultant uh, perform the traffic study. So I wanted to bring that to the board's attention. Um, you know, so if the board would be in favor of that, great. If the board's not in favor of that and would like to select the other, uh, the low, I think the lowest bidder, um, my client, uh, you know, will move forward with the traffic study either way. So on this matter, I'm gonna I'm gonna recognize Evan first because um, it's a procurement I think a procurement issue. But let's see what Evan has to say. Uh, just general reminder: the board authorized my office to award uh, the respondent to the RFQ to the lowest, uh, most advantageous price and most qualified bidder or proposer. So it's low. It's so best so price for the most qualified firm. Or, by excuse the me, qualified, qualified best price. Yeah. Qual okay. Um, we sent this out. I so want to. This for the minutes. It's the lowest bid of the of responsive the firm. Responsive and qualified That's respondent. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Uh, so my office uh, um, provided the RFQ and solicited responses. I believe from six or seven consultants, um, and I have to refer back to my records because I didn't come prepared with the RFQ tonight. Um, the lowest price was $13,000 for the qualified firm. It was either Vanass or it was McMahon. I will need to confirm that, and I can do so in my emails. Um, and so it would be my department's recommendation if the board is looking for a recommendation. Um, I guess the department has no issue with Mr. Malegny uh, contracting or increasing the scope of his consultant services to include a traffic impact assessment, but I would still recommend the board conduct its own traffic assessment and, or, and peer review of that traffic impact analysis. So um, I would re still recommend that the board proceed with hiring its own consultant for this specific purpose. So, uh, so you're, you're recommending that we continue that authorization for your office to choose the traffic consultant based on procurement rules. Yes. And that that consultant conduct the traffic study that the applicant can Correct. do their own traffic study, separate traffic study, and, and or review, review the ours. Exactly. Um, so how do people fail? Oh, I think yeah. I, 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 I agree. No, that makes sense. Right. That's fair. 
Yep. So we should continue on with the previous authorization mm -hmm. that um, the planning department is going to procure and choose the traffic yep. consultant to do the traffic study. Thank you. So, no, fair, I understand completely. But thank you. <laughs> Tell your applicant thank you for the offer. I but appreciate <laughs> that. So, uh, so with that, um, you know, obviously my client does want to move this forward. So he will. I will. Uh, uh, confirm with Evan that we'll move forward with the with the traffic engineer. Uh, so obviously we'd be asking for a continuance. Uh, I would suspect probably the maybe the second meeting in February. I don't know if that's enough time or not, but that's basically 60 days. That I figure that should be more than enough time. I'm just Remember? looking up what the date is. If memory serves me for the board, oh. I believe the scope of work for the traffic study was indicated to take between four and six weeks following the commencement. Um, there's a contract execution period that will take some time. Because um, we still need to enter into an agreement with this particular consultant. I'll need to get that agreement to council for their review. Um, 60 days may not be enough. Okay. Um, so maybe the second meeting in March? So we have March 1st or March 15th? I would probably, for safety, based on Evan's comments, March 15th. Okay. 710? Yes. Um, okay, so before I continue it, I, I, I do want to give an opportunity sure. for the public to make any comments yeah, regarding this. Um, you're here. Do you have anything else to say? No, those are the only okay. two matters that I wanted to address tonight, unless there was anything else. Madam Chair, just one point of clarification. Um, the uh, most advantageous in terms of best price and qualified firm was uh, submitted by Vanass and Associates. Oh, good. Okay. All right. And do they know that? That they're the... Uh, they do. They are the aware. Okay. And we've also notified the uh, other consultants that they have not they have, have not provided the most advantageous price. If something changes and the, uh, the Benass is incapable of, of following through on the scope, since so much time has passed, it would be my suggestion that we suggest or, or request proceeding with the next most advantageous proposal. Okay. I think that we should authorize Evan right. to, to go to the next bidder if... Um, <laughs> if there's a serious time issue with the top choice at this point. So currently, Vanass is the one been, who's been notified of the... Is that good with everybody? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank do, you. Do you want to vote for that, or you good? Well, just for the applicant's benefit who identified uh, that the board, just to be clear in your vote, that you are awarding this particular uh, scope to Vanass and Associates. Okay, I'll Ooh. take it. Okay. Is there a second? Uh, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? I'm an aye as well. Thank you. Okay, and then also I'd, I'd entertain a Make motion. Make a motion we continue the public hearing to... Um, no, I'm going to hear Pete that tonight. Oh. But I'd like to make a motion that if uh, the Vaness cannot do it within the prescribed time frame, that the planner is, uh, the town planner is authorized to go to the next qualified bidder. So be. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? <clears throat> okay, so we have the plan. Yep. All right, so if there's, any, if there's anybody uh, from the public, hi, come on up. And just identify yourself and uh, state your business. And what do, so anyways, we have a 720, so what do I do? We'll be quick. No, we're not gonna be quick. No, open the 720 okay. and then I continue it. Okay. All right, so seeing that the appointed time has arrived, the chair opens up the 720 and the 725 public hearing. The applicant is, Ple is Pleasant Wood Homes, LLC. The location is 22 to Terrace, uh, Sisters Map 29, Block 198. And the applicant requests the approval of a modification to the Spring Hill West Definitive Subdivision Plan of Land that would modify the lot lines of lots 40, 41, 42, give adequate frontage of the three new building lots proposed for incorporation into the subdivision. The 725 hearing is the applicant requests a modification to a special permit approved October 6, 1989, that approved the creation of a 45 single family building lot and cluster uh, configuration on 23.7 three eight acres of land and preserve 17.15 acres of open space. I mean, so, yeah, go ahead. I make a motion we continue the public hearing. How long do you guys need? 15 minutes? Not even. Five minutes. Not even. Five. Yeah. Okay. All right, so give them um, give 15 because I have something to talk about. Seven, 720. Seven, 
Well, it's 7.45 right now. Seven, how about 7.35? 7.35. All right. Oh, that's 10 minutes. Okay. All right, 7.40. <laughs> like this is a 740. Okay. okay. Is there a second? All in favor say aye. 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 All right. So everybody here who's for Tudor Lane, um, uh, we'll open that up at 745. Now, you gave these to me. What are these? That's uh Oh, it's correspondence from you guys. Okay. There you go. All right. Go ahead, sir. Hi. Hi. Um, Robert Matthew, uh, Peter Briggs, and Lance Lambros from Nicoletta's Way Association. The last time we were here, um, there was a there was a discussion about Nicoletta's Way uh, providing access to Marcello Mang Manganelli, um, and we had we had worked that the deal that you'll see there in the back and forth was the lawyers going through and agreeing on a deal verbally, uh, back and forth, and then it just stopped. Um, so that's about ten percent of the road cost. We made this, we, we promised you guys, I mean, this is why we're here, mm -hmm. is specifically, you guys asked us to make sure that if we could make a safer issue, we weren't blocking anything or causing any issues, and we were open for business. There's a very reasonable proposal in there. Again, it's probably 10% of the value of the road, of a new road, um, that went back and forth. You'll see the red line from the lawyers, and uh, it just stopped. We didn't know. I didn't even know that this had come to come to meeting again until Lance had found it. So we wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of that um, and everything had stopped. Lance, you had a couple of things you wanted to add to that? No. I think, I think what we want to mention to the board clearly is that you folks asked us to consider this. I think everybody in the community knows we listened to our neighbors, we listened to the planning board, and went to the applicant and tried to make the best deal that we could. I think there was an impression that we were looking for millions of dollars. We're clearly not. The prices is $35,000 per curb cut. It comes at 300 grand, and he would have to resurface when we were done, which, as we calculated, because we've looked into the road cost of a new road, somewhere between two and three million dollars, we don't understand why the applicant wouldn't take advantage of working with us on Nicoletta's Way. When we purchased Nicoletta's Way as an association, we did so for this exact reason. We wanted to protect our assets, Everybody who's a member of our board pretty much lives in Mashpee or Sandwich or Falmouth or, or Barnstable. We're all Cape people. We want to keep that, that area nice. If any of you have had the opportunity to drive down Nicoletta's Way, it's beautiful. I mean, Bobby has invested tens of thousands of dollars in flowers out there, nicely mm -hmm. paved it. Mm -hmm. Pete's planted trees along the whole side. These guys keep it clean. They plow it. They sand it. And we want, when that side gets developed, which we expected it would, for them to keep up their part of it. And we always thought that we would make a deal with whoever purchased the property to be able to do that and keep the characteristic of the other properties that are there to keep our values up. So we just really wanted you to know, and quite honestly wanted our neighbors who live across the street and in the area to know that we really did our best due diligence to make a, what we thought was a fantastic offer to say, this is really what's best for the town. We really, truly believe, I mean, we drive it every day. Yeah, it's, we have safety concerns, it's too. It's a dangerous I mean. road. And we think if you add another road, there's going to be more problems to that road. And we're willing to let him work off Nicoletta's way for a very reasonable price. I know you can't force him to do it. I understand the applicant can allow him to do it. But I think what we wanted to come here tonight to tell you is we heard your request to us. We heard our neighbor's request. And we tried to do the best that we could to allow this applicant to use Nicoletta's way. And we still have an open contract available for him to consider. Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, we, we've mentioned a, a couple things. You know, Pete and I, I had 80 trucks coming in out of there. Pete's got a, a lot of guys working in and out of that road. And uh, we had concerns about um, another road going in, what that would do. I mean, that that's a high speed of traffic coming down past uh, Stonewood. God forbid, uh, uh, you get another a break in that. I mean, you're talking, you know, F-350s, F-550s with a trailer. We're not exactly going to pull out of there uh, like a Porsche. Um, so there needs to be, you know, some consideration of that. We, we thought we'd created a nice solution. So I think the biggest thing was we wanted to make sure you guys knew. We didn't, we didn't even, I didn't even know that, that you know, we, I, I just knew that it stalled a bit. I thought they were working on stuff. So you can see the correspondence. It was important to us. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas. Um, all those details about how many trucks going on in and out and da 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 da. You know, anything you can give to Evan about your businesses, about from the association's point of view, sure. what traffic is coming in and out, 
what are the problems that you experience, get it to Evan with a request that it goes to the traffic consultant. Sure. Okay? Sure. Um, anything? Well, all I can say, how much does it cost for one life? Yeah. That's one life and it's another. You should talk to your people to do this deal. All it takes is one life and it's not worth it won't 300000 or whatever. It won't be long. It almost is It right won't now. be. I, yeah. There should be, be two signs on 130 saying truck entrances mm -hmm. further down. There's no signs on 130 even knowing there's an industrial park there. It's the two streets across the way that really make it hairy. If you go exactly. there, oh, yeah. you see yes. what we're talking about. And Catherine and I, is, has even been down before because we were even worried at times bicyclists. Like people fly by Catherine on the Laurent? walkway. Pardon me? Catherine? What's Our Catherine. Oh. Must be Catherine. Um, oh, sorry. DPW. Just because, yeah, okay, you, know, it, it, you know, you're on a bicycle there. The trucks are coming in and out. If you guys see it, it's a straightaway on our end. And then it comes on to 130. The right turn's not bad. The left turn is. It's wide open coming from Stonewood towards us. You're doing 60. And if there's a, someone in between us, that worries us. And especially in the summertime, <laughs> there are people that really don't know the area and they'll be riding their bikes there and, you know, not paying attention with their kids. I hate to see some little kids get hit by it. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough spot. So we just wanted you guys to know that we thought we gave a very... It doesn't really make a lot of business sure sense to us. We think we're doing everything the way you want it. We wanted to make sure everybody knew that we followed through with what the, what you guys had asked us to it do. It sure looks like it. Yeah. And you haven't heard from him? He just nope. walked away? I, no. I we, mean, actually, we actually met with the lawyers, had a handshake on a deal, everything. We tweaked out a few things, kept everything the same, sent the paperwork. And then just went quiet. Yeah, you see the red lines? They were supposed to be signed off. And there was one issue about authority that I, I can't even speak to. My lawyers can understand that. I, I can't. Yeah. About and, who's got the authority to do what. And Madam Chair, one of, the, one of the other questions was we had considered, we asked him to widen the road so it was safer coming out to Route 130. Yeah. He talked with the town planner who said at that time that plan, that road had been approved. So he, we, his point was we were asking him to do something that he wasn't allowed to do. So we agreed that we wouldn't force him to do that. But if, in fact, he went for more permits later down the line, because in his proposal to us, I think it was only seven lots, if he went for, for proposal of two more lots, that he would go for the widening at that time. We didn't really want to do that, but we thought if that's the only way we can do it, then based on what the town planner had explained to him, that would be the appropriate way. But we still think that the end of Nicoletta's Way should be widened for safety issues. If you, if you drive by it, look on the, on the right side looking down the road, you'll see that it's all potholes. It's just not wide enough. Everybody takes that turn coming in. And if, you know, if you've got a trailer like we, we have, um, everything bounces out of the trailer. It's a, it's a mess. It's a mess. It's hard to keep it up. We've tried to throw stone dust down and everything else, but it needs to be cleaned up. And if we were going to do a bunch of construction work there, that would be the right time. So that issue about widening Nicoletta Way is in this document? Yes. It was originally yeah. in the contract, but because the town planner had advised us that he couldn't enforce that in, the, in his request for seven lots, we said you, when you request the permission to use two other lots, which there's enough land to do that, then we could put the widening in. And I believe that's what the town planner has suggested to the applicant, and we were all on board with that. And we're glad to answer any other questions. If you have questions of us, we're, we're glad to answer any. I do have, have one, though. When the traffic study's done at this time and of the And so, year. you know what? I'm going to need all your names. So, for Robert the record. Robert Maffey. And? Peter Briggs. Okay. Lance Lambros. Okay. Go ahead, Peter. I guess this would be for everyone. When that traffic study's done out there, if we do a traffic study right now in the dead of the winter, you, as well as I know, that changes as the spring, the summer, when we start to get busy and it starts mm -hmm. to become a lot of traffic, your traffic study right now will not be accurate to what it is eight, nine months out of the year if you do it in the middle of January or February. Mm -hmm. Just something the board should take into consideration that that's, Good it's, it's unrealistic. It'll yeah. triple by that time and when the landscapers, which we are, do business, we do a lot of it, obviously. That's why I think you need to give us what, what you, were, you were saying, some numbers about how many Trucks go out every every day and da 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 da. traffic up and down one third. Right. Down, yeah, and our yeah, road, our I road, mean, it's, it is incredibly different come April 1st. <coughs> People yeah. start coming down. So, Evan, can you address that? I just wanted a, two points of clarity. Um, Mr. Lambros had, had our conversation generally the right, but I wanted to clarify one particular point to the board. When we had spoken relative to uh, including in the agreement, proposed agreement between the trustees and Mr. Malegny, 
um, the discussion about widening the road, I wanted to make sure that the language of that agreement was considerate of the fact that you, they, the agreement couldn't compel Mr. Malegny to widen the road without coming to you for a modification of the layout. So he couldn't unilaterally decide to widen it without your approval. You. So I didn't want him to, that, I wanted that nuance to be yeah, that, rectified. That actually, that's a room of how we remembered it, right, Lance? I mean, so the whole idea was, okay, fine, we'll do it afterwards. And, and, and we just figured, like, you know, if we look at that, I don't think you guys would have a problem right. with it or anybody else. Yeah. And then the, because, the, the reason that, for... Because that road is not owned by him. Right. No, it's owned right. by yeah, us. And, and the reason that I suggested that it would have to be in a different filing, and it couldn't, the changes, their modifications to Nicoletta's way that were contemplated in this agreement couldn't happen in this public hearing process because it's well outside the scope of the public hearing notice. So it would have to be a new application. Okay. Um, and then the, there was one final point relative to the traffic study. And see, the scope of the traffic study that we had solicited uh, responses for Obviously, you know, we were in Cape Cod, winter traffic, less volume. Um, the scope of the study was, will be considerate of the, you know, industry best practice for seasonal adjustments. Um, you're still dealing with estimates, you know, obviously, and um, so it's not going to be a perfect traffic count on a July morning. Um, but we did consider seasonal adjustments in the scope of the RFQ. Yeah, I would say, I mean, we had 140 employees at our location on the corner, 80 trucks, all the employees coming in early in the morning, and then the trucks coming back and forth to pick up mulch and everything else. Like, I yeah. bet that that's not going to show up in the traffic study. Um, you know, and, and then Pete's got a bazillion guys down the road, and then there's all the other <laughs> companies on the road. So I think it's it would be... I, I, it would be hard without them there to actually record in June, July, August to be able to really get the traffic. But it's it's intense. Understood. It's intense. That's all. Hey, Madam Chair, just a comment on what the town planner had mentioned. He also said that we, as an association down the line, could permit could ask for request to widen the road. Yes. Which yes. certainly, for safety reasons, we would do that if the other side of the road got developed. And even if the other side of the road didn't, perhaps we could come back in the future sometime to resolve some of the issues that we deal with now we before, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, seven more lots gets developed there. We, we really, we're not, we always expected that to be built. Yeah. We truly, and I say this truly, we're here because we want it to be safe. If you can find a better way to do it, than Nicoletta's way, then we would expect you to do it. We just think that Nicoletta's way is the safest way to develop that land, allow him to develop the land, make as much money as he can, to pay us what we think is fair and reasonable and not gouge in anybody, and really what's best for the neighbors and the community. And, I, and it really should be a win-win-win for everybody. So we don't know why it, it's not, but we wanted to at least come and let you know that we've really done our due diligence to try to make the best deal that we can for, for us and the town of Mashby. Okay. All right. So I want to ask if there's anybody else uh, from the public who would like to speak. Okay. okay. Thank so you. thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Listen, thanks for listening to us. We appreciate it. See you later. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, Just your, your, why don't you sit down and uh, your name and your address, please. Um, my name's Sam Jeffreyon. Uh, we own property on Echo Road. Okay. We would also like to see them use Nicoletta Way because as a property owner on the left-hand side of Echo Road, this road is going to expose all of our backyards to travel. Mm. So, A, it's going to be ugly. Construction companies' backyards aren't the most attractive places. And plus, it opens it up to vandalism, theft, or whatever, where, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's just not the right thing. And I agree about the traffic study. If you don't do the traffic study when all of these earthworking companies, because Echo Road is also full of those kind of companies that aren't working a lot in January and February, you're not even going to come close to the amount of traffic. Echo Road is already busy with Stonewood on the corner and the way they get their deliveries. Mm -hmm. And now with Cape Cod Coffee, one more street over, and the amount of stuff that goes on on that road. Another road is the last thing that section of Route 130 needs. Okay. So that's it. Thank you. I Thank think you. that we should instruct the town planner to, to pose that question to the uh, traffic engineer yeah. uh, regarding um, you know, off-season study of the area. Sure. There won't be an average study at all. 
I know there's way to, ways to ways. Uh, yeah, to there's ways to do it. it. They're Out a pretty good here. company. Oh, I've our, used them our oh. I, I, one moment, Art, out. because our our there's board engineer would like to. Yes. You know, obviously you're dealing with estimate estimates. So the chair recognizes our board engineer Ed Pesci, and um, I've got you know what Ed, hold on, I've got some. Uh, yep. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ed. I just want to make the point for everyone to hear that traffic engineers commonly do traffic studies outside of the peak time of year. Sure, I understand the reason for, for biasing your field measurements for the peak time of year, but it's done all the time outside of the peak time of year. And there are recognized methodologies for them to adjust what they calculate for the peak period of the year. So they don't just take the traffic conditions today, they take traffic conditions today, adjust them for growth, and adjust them for the peak period of the year. There are recognized ways to do that. So getting the data from um, the abutters there uh, is a great idea. 140 employees coming to work, great. Uh, size of the business, types of businesses. Um, I think that Vanessa is very good at this. Uh, you've worked with Vanessa for many, many years, many projects, uh, and they know exactly what to do there. I just wanted to allay everyone's fears that um, you know, it doesn't have to wait till August or July for that to be done. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Um, so I recognize. Yes. Hi. Your Arden, name and address. Uh, Arden Russell, Sturgis Lane. Um, I want to reiterate and confirm the intensity of use of that area, but. Um, what I do want to ask is the status of the transfer of the four acres of open space that's required. Attorney just left the room. They, ver <laughs> they verbally committed to ensure that a certificate of compliance is issued prior to any development of the site. I don't know the status of that request from the commission, though. OK, but so far, nothing still. As far as I'm aware, there is no uh, firm action the for either the applicant or. might not be able to require that until we close the public hearing and take a vote. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I, I mean, I feel like it was a requirement long before there was any proposed activity on this road, and it should have been done uh, 20 years ago, yeah. but. I don't think we have authority to do that until we close our public hearing. Okay. Thank um, you. Is uh, there anybody else from the public? So I just, I just want to invite Chris back up, um, and I just want to let you know that we just received public comment on the status of the four acres of land uh, that's going to go into open space. So if you have any update, that would be appreciated. Um, I don't have an update as of yet for the board, but obviously based on our last meeting, it's the board has, is requiring us to do that prior to anything being approved by this board. So that will be done. It just... Um, it just hasn't happened yet, but we will do it. So, and that would have to be done irrespective of whether the board approved the project or not. So, because as I say, it's a requirement of the uh, of the Cape Cod Commission. So, but I'll I'll okay. move. I'll make sure that the applicant puts that on the front burner. Um, I I also am I'm going to go out on a limb and say that um, you've heard from at least one planning board member, if not more. Uh, regarding uh, the use of Nicoletta Way as an alternate. So I would I would appreciate you reiterating that to your project proponent. I will. ASAP, before the traffic study, you know? Sure. That contract gets signed. This is this is the opportunity right now to, to uh, go in a way that I think that the board would like you to go. Sure. I will uh, certainly the take... The community would like you to go, I should say. I will uh, certainly impress upon the applicant to revisit. Um, you know, as I say, I don't, I don't think it's productive for me to get into the back and forth, but I will certainly impress upon the applicant what the board has stated tonight. So. And we'll extend it if you want to get a mediator in there. <laughs> um, but I know that uh, there's plenty of attorneys involved, right. and I think you should use the Maybe skills that you have. <laughs> Maybe too many. But um, I, I, I think there's willingness to make a deal. Sure. So. I appreciate that. Is there Thanks, anything? I make a motion we continue this public hearing to March 15th, was it? Yes. yes. At 710. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Say aye. Aye. Sure, thank oh, you. Open that All right, so seeing the appointed time has arrived, the chair opens up the public hearing for Pleasant Wood Homes LLC. I'm sorry, I have my. Okay. 
Pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter, Mass General Laws Chapter 41, Section. Section um, 81T and the Mashpee rules reg and regulations governing the subdivision of land. The Mashpee Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022 at 710 um, in the events room at Mashpee Public Library, 40, 64 Steeple Street, Mashpee, Mass, which has been continued to today. Um, to consider an application made by Pleasant Wood Homes LLC for approval of a modification to Spring Hill West Definitive Subdivision Plan of Land that would modify the lot lands, the lot lines of lots 41, 40, 41, and 42 to give adequate frontage for three new building lots proposed for incorporation into the subdivision. The three proposed lots, the three proposed lots will be created and incorporated into the cluster subdivision are on a parcel of land totaling 6.024 acres and is addressed as 20 Tudor Terrace, Assessor's Map 29, Block 198. This proposal will continue the cluster configuration of the existing subdivision and will add 2.49 acres of open space, which has been increased. Um, consistent with the requirements of the Mashby Zoning Bylaw, the time of the cluster subdivision approval in 1989. The plans may be reviewed in the office of the town clerk or the town planner at Mashpee Town Hall. Okay. I have to read the other uh, public hearing notice then too. Pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 9, the Mashpee Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022 at 715 in the events room at Mashpee Public Library at 64 Steeple Street, Mashpee Mass, which has been continued um, to tonight. Um, to consider application made by Pleasant Woods Home LLC to modify a special permit approved October 6, 1989, that approved the creation of 45 single family building lots in configure, cluster configuration on 23.738 acres of land and preserve 17.153 acres of open space. The applicant seeks to modify the special permit decision to incorporate the additional three building lots proposed and further to recognize the modified layout of lots 40, 41, and 42, as shown on Spring Hill West Definitive Subdivision Plan. So these um, public hearing notices were submitted by me, Chair of the Planning Board, Mary Wagan, and they ran in the newspaper on October 19th, 2022, and October 26, 2022. So to start off, I always start with the project proponent. Great. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the Board, Attorney Christopher Corain, representing the applicant. Um, when, uh, and with me tonight is Mark Dibb from Cape and Islands Engineering and also the project proponent, uh, Daniel Marsters. Um, so we, pr we brought this before the board uh, about a month or so ago. Um, there were a number of um, things that the board wanted us to address, um, some related to uh, Ed Pesci's comments, and I know that him and Mark have uh, communicated several times, uh, and I think we've provided revised plans that uh, address uh, the questions and comments that Ed had. Um, I have provided the board with a letter um, to address some of the board's questions regarding uh, the existing condition, uh, special condi the conditions of the special permit. Uh, there was a question about a, an, a, an ancient way uh, that's not impacted by this particular uh, modification, but uh, the board did ask to address it, and also some questions about uh, the by what bylaw provisions that we are uh, going uh, under. So I believe I've addressed all of those and then some in the letter that I provided the board. Uh, the board also, we also have provided to the board with an overlay um, based on the neighbor's questions about how far away, how much clearing. So I think that we've done a good job of addressing that. Um, so, you know, with that, I think the biggest uh, things were the engineering, and I can certainly let Mark and Ed speak to that. Uh, with some of the conditions, I know there's a question about the monitoring, the well monitoring. Yeah. That was part of the initial special permit. Uh, it was to be done by the Homeowners Association. While there was a Homeowners Association originally established in 1990, the restrictive covenants that uh, were also um, established at that time 
had no provision for extending them. They were un unlimited as to time, which means that they have expired. They expired in September of 2020, because under the statute, they only have a 30-year period um, by law. And so currently, there is no homeowners association, so nobody's doing any monitoring. Um, we don't. We think in this particular case that any monitoring for these lots would not be required, and I'll let Mark speak to the technical aspect of that. But these lots are, you know, they're they're large. They're 40,000 square feet. They're larger than any of the lots that are um, uh, in the subdivision. So we don't feel that these particular lots would uh, create any. Um, uh, overload of nitrogen or anything like that. You know, again, I'll, I'll let Mark speak to that. So I would ask the board to um, not require any monitoring. Again, you know, there is no homeowner association and, you know, I don't think it was ever done and no one, no one seemed to care to enforce it over the last 30 years. Um, and then secondarily, there was a condition regarding the thousand square foot lawns. Um, you know, our review of the neighboring, the development, all those lawns are greater than 1,000 square feet, so no one uh, seems to have uh, abided by that condition. Again, um, we are proposing lawns that are greater than 1,000 square feet, consistent with what's in the neighborhood. We have provided the board with uh, two uh, mitigation tactics. Uh, one is, I know in another development, I think it was uh, Blue Castle. Aqua Highlands that the board, uh, that the applicant provided uh, funds for shellfish stock uh, in lieu, uh, to allow the lawns to be greater than a thousand, or whatever the lawns were, uh, we're willing to do that. We have also um, proposed some conditions uh, that we took from proposed conservation conditions, uh, which we would, regarding lawn areas and how they should be uh, installed, and we'd be happy to have the board incorporate those, uh, again, in consideration of allow, basically waiving the thousand foot lawn condition. So. I think those are the major things. I, I know that, uh, I shouldn't say that. Um, as to the bylaw, so back in 1988, the board had the discretion if it felt that it was in the best, in, in the public good to allow for lots that were smaller in size, less frontage, less setbacks um, under their cluster, cluster subdivision bylaw. Um, all these lots are undersized for what the uh, requirements were back then. Um, in today's bylaw, the zoning is 80,000 square feet minimums. We are proposing ones that are less than that. There are 100 feet of frontage for those that are on a curve it is, it is based on the setback line. So in this particular case, the setback line, we only have, I think, 100 feet. So what we'd be requesting from the board is to set the, the standard at 25,000, the, the minimum of 25,000 square feet. I said 65 feet because uh, I was looking at the curve, which is 70, but um, I suppose it could be at the 100 feet. Um, but those are the two requests. We're not requesting any relief from any of the front yard, uh, rear yard, or side yard setbacks. And what's the, what's the percentage of lot coverage? Uh, the lot coverage would, uh, it's 20% in the R5. Yeah, yeah I don't think we're looking for anything up above that. So the minimum would be based on today's standards, 20%. These lots are big enough. Minimum lot frontage of 65 feet? 65 feet, because we're on the curve at 70. We're showing 70 feet along all these curves. So just to give myself a little wiggle room. So I was thinking of going right to Ed. Yeah. yeah. Um, if, if, unless you have something you'd like to add at this point. Go ahead. Just that the, the ma majority of items we provided were informational. Um, there was just questions on us providing additional information. Uh, we provided an existing condition sheet. We provided the exhibit of uh, building envelopes, um, as well as a overlay of both the subdivision plan with the topography and utilities in the, in the, in the street. Um, uh, resolution of the comments from the previous hearing and Ed's comments resulted in some relatively minor changes. I uh, just do want to, we submitted new plans a couple weeks ago. Um, today, we just submitted those reduced sets. Um, I'll just, there's only two changes between those two sets of plans. On the, the first page, we just added the existing nitrogen loading credit land notes. 
that were already mm -hmm. recorded mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just the square footages that reference uh, those existing notes. We're not seeking any more nitrogen credit. The lots we've provided are adequate lots for um, for the developer and they you know, meet the most stringent nitrogen restriction lots. Um, that's one of the factors. And um, the second thing was on the third sheet, we provided a cross-section detail regarding how drainage would work, um, both at a, an apron from the street, as well as requiring all the driveways to either drain away from the street or have uh, some drainage included, um, basically not allowing the entire house and driveway to flow onto the Tudor Terrace cul-de-sac, as well as roof drains uh, for those houses. So those are the only two, uh, three changes um, that are on these new plans. And, and, and tell me more again about the roof, the roof drainage. Um, typical to any, any plan that goes through conservation, um, it, there'll be a, a series of gutters going to downspouts to um, roof drains. So the, the just the runoff from the roofs will not freely flow into the grass, onto the land. They'll go into um, dry wells, dry roof, wells. roof drains. And then, uh, if I may, Madam Chair, just one other point I just want to make sure that we highlight is we did bring the open space up to the 50%. I think it was a yes. little bit under at the last hearing plan, yes. but <laughs> now we have brought that up to 50%. And so that meets cr current day requirements. Okay. So. so so you're saying <clears throat> that in the 89 cluster subdivision approval, it was 2.49 acres, and so it's going up to 3.012. Oh, okay, I was wondering about that. Okay, good. So if it's okay with the, the board members, I'd like to recognize Ed Pesci, because they did a lot of yep. work on this. Um, and Ed, I do want you to summarize for us that whole nitrogen credit thing. Remember, we talked about that a lot last time, but go ahead, Ed. So I, I uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So yes, we, uh, Mark and I did have a work session yesterday which generated the revised plans that you all have now. Um, there, there's only two sheets that they provided, but Mark, you're, I assume you're still planning to provide a four sheet set, isn't that correct? Correct, there was no changes on the other two sheets, so they're still applicable though, yes. Right, so um, the, uh, changes that I requested at the last meeting was to protect, there were a couple things I recommended to protect the drainage in, Tudor, in the circle at Tudor Terrace. One was to provide roof drain, dry wells, so that uh, there'd be infiltration of the roof and not discharge or runoff uh, that could get to the, to the circle. And then the second was to control the runoff from the driveways. Mark has provided, rather than providing a full grading plan for uh, a house footprint, which will vary, uh, he's put a new um, cross-section detail um, for the driveway with appropriate notes explaining uh, what needed to be done. And I asked him to provide, a, uh, with that detail, a five-foot paved apron from the edge of the existing pavement on Tudor Terrace to the interior, going to the interior of the, of the driveway. So there'd be a transition from pavement to whatever material the driveway was gonna become could become cobblestone, could become pavers, could be asphalt. But I wasn't sure and I wanted to make sure that that, that, that transition was not in the public way, it was on the private land. Um, he also shows the dry well and, and a note there, the dry wells, the roof drain dry wells, and a note that all the houses shall be connected. So the board has enforcement power there. Uh, we have enforcement power when the houses go to get constructed, so does the, so does the, the building official. Um, the last item, that I mentioned at the last hearing to protect the drainage in the street was to have the drainage system inspected and pumped and the catch basin is pumped on the on in Tudor Terrace. Likely that hasn't been done in a long time, if ever, and everyone agreed to that. So that's not on the plan, but I would recommend that be a condition of your decision should you to, should vote to approve this. I'm sorry, say that I, condition I that again. As, Ed, say that condition again. Yes, so that the condition would be to have the existing drainage system, including catch basins and piping, inspected by a professional engineer, catch basins pumped of all existing sediment, <coughs> and a letter provided to the board to 
describing and summarizing that inspection. And I would expect that Cape and Islands would be, um, you know, um, assigned to do that, and that would become part of the record. And this would be the existing uh, drainage system on Tudor Terrace or in front of these? Correct. Okay. And if they fail, so I don't, I, yeah. I don't know how many. I don't know how many uh, catch basins that, that involves. I know there's one in the circle area. Um, I don't recall. I'm not looking at a, a photo of it right now, but I don't know if there's one or two. But um, there might be uh, another pair upstream, and it would be reasonable for me to say that from the cul-de-sac, the neck of the cul-de-sac, upstream or towards uh, the main road of. Um, I'm struggling for the name of the road at the end of the street, Windsor Way, thank you. Windsor um, Way. As we, from the cul-de-sac towards Windsor Way, at least the, the catch basins that are in the cul-de-sac circle and the first set of catch basins upstream or towards Windsor Way. At least those, those sets of catch basins at a minimum. And as you started to say, um, I believe if there are, if there's anything in failure, they'll be obligated to repair it and provide documentation that that was repaired or, or, or upgraded. Okay, so we have we have a, con a suggested condition from our engineer that the existing drainage system of Tudor Terrace, starting from the cul-de-sac upstream towards Windsor Way, including the first set of catch basins on Tudor Way. Um, be inspected by a professional engineer, the catch basins are pumped, and the letter and a, a report of the inspections be uh, submitted to the planning board. Yes, Evan. I just want to uh, relay to the board and the applicant that Tudor Terrace is a town layout, so I would request that that work be coordinated with the Mashpee DPW. In coordination with Ma right. with Mashpee DPW. So in, on that note, I just don't, like if they fail, I don't know that we can, my clients, you know, the applicant can do anything because they're, they're, they're town owned. I was just going to ask Ed. <laughs> okay, so if they fail, what happens? So that's a good question. I can't imagine the uh, DPW is going to have any objection for repairs in public way for particular catch basins that don't function right. I, I don't think there's any catch basins that don't function right. They just need to be pumped out and maintained. And the... The, the drainage system on the, and the cul-de-sac haven't been, who owns those? It's the same thing. It's part of the public way, okay. part of two All thirds. Right. All right, so we have one condition suggested by the engineer. Go ahead, Ed, anything else? Yeah, so you started to ask also about the nitrogen loading summary. And I went over that um, quite extensively with Mark yesterday. However, Mark has not provided you some of the documentation that he gave me um, to explain some of that. So Mark, I think it'd be useful for the board to have in the record the marked up plan um, that marked in red that shows the number of bedrooms and the number of lots and the total area. The thing that you had marked up for me yesterday I think that that would be beneficial with a cover letter just explaining that. So I think it's, it's the obligation of the, of the applicant to provide that clarification. I will tell you that Mark suitably, uh, I think, suitably explained that to me and we went over it together. Uh, Mark had to do a little discovery work on, on his own to try to figure it out because it's been so long out there, but it's quite old. Uh, but I believe his interpretation of um, the easement, the, the, the uh, uh, easement document that was submitted before, is correct, and that the total uh, limit of the number of bedrooms is 31. Because if you recall, the, the document referred to 28 bedrooms on one page and 31 bedrooms on another page. Mm -hmm. And so, this grant of Title V nitrogen loading restriction and easement document uh, that was uh, provided at the last hearing, I think he clarified that to me. Properly, I believe it is 31. Uh, he demonstrated where the 31 came from, and I believe um, my next question to him was, "Well, that's great, Mark. What about the new lots we're creating? Don't we have to provide nitrogen loading credit plans to that? Tell me why we don't." 
and Mark, I think, adequately explained that to me as well. So, um, and here's the here's the answer. Mark, jump in if I miss anything. Essentially, every lot that you're seeing here that is new, 48, 49, and 50, essentially are the new lots um, in the un, previously undeveloped parcel. So there's there's a basically three new lots, even though portions of two other lots exist in that undeveloped parcel. They're not additional uh, uh, lots for the whole subdivision. So really it's a net three additional lots. Anyway, um, what, I've, what he's shown and demonstrated to me was that each of those lots exceeds 40,000 square feet and that each one of them um, then complies with the DEP nitrogen loading uh, requirement restriction for nitrogen sensitive areas by having um, 40,000 square feet for a four bedroom home. So these would be restricted to four bedroom. They can be three bedroom, but they'd be restricted to no more than four bedroom. And I would recommend that that also be a condition uh, for lots 48, 49, and 50, that they, these new lots no longer will not, not be allowed to be constructed um, more than four bedroom. I think it would be captured that way by the Board of Health because they realize that this is in a zone two um, and that that would be, um, you know, perhaps policed in that, that manner, but this is just another way to, to add to make sure we, we're covering it. Um, if those of you who are, are listening are worried about lot 41A and lot 42, um, Mark, at my request, added additional notes underneath that description talking about nitrogen loading credit land that was provided already to those parcels to get the 40,000 square feet. Okay. okay. So I went through this back and forth with Mark several times because it was not easy to understand, I grant you. Um, I don't expect everybody to absorb this initially tonight, but I will tell you that I'm absolutely satisfied that uh, the nitrogen sensitive land use restrictions in Title V have been addressed by, by the current design of the subdivision. So what you're saying is those other, that lot 41A and 42A are shy of 40,000 square feet. So there's Correct. other land set aside for the, for the square footage that's the difference between their actual square footage and 40,000 square feet. Right. And, so and that's where the nitrogen credit is calculated, okay. They were configured differently before and they had to have credit land from somewhere else which was provided and it's better, it, Accompanying this plan would be the other plan that I, I requested that, to Mark that, that he provide, showing the, the, the credit land for each lot, and that explains it a little bit better. And if that was in the file with a letter, anybody could go back to it and say, okay, now I understand how they did it. Mark, is that fair to ask? Uh, yes. The um, again, the let, what I did was take the recorded plan of land that showed the nitrogen credit land in just each lot on that plan, I put the bedroom. Like lot 30 had three bedrooms and I just, in red, just identified the bedrooms, counted them up and they came to 31. So I was just, just showing a different way of, of looking at that map. It was really, you know, it's nothing that would change the nitrogen loading plan. It's nothing that would modify anything to do with the nitrogen. It was just an exhibit for our discussion. So, but um, I'd be happy to provide it if, uh, if needed. That's good. Okay. Anything else, Ed? Um, I think uh, Mark and I talked about the two conditions that we heard earlier tonight, and that being um, a thousand square foot of lawn um, on a previous decision and the water quality uh, sampling. Um, so I, I was going to recommend as, as a mitigation for requiring full water quality sampling. And for, for some reason, the original decision from, uh, I want to say 1989, required an awful, a, a pretty extensive um, monitoring program. And I don't understand why it never happened, but um, you know, this was in the era, if you remember, of Otis and the um, and and uh, MMR, as it's called, you know, uh, Joint Base Cape Cod, was just just then discovering 
some of the contamination that was migrating off base. And so I think that's where it came from. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm very, very familiar with that because from 1991 to 1998, I was in the Superfund Management Program there. So I'm very familiar with that whole project. So um, I know that there are, there are not significant groundwater plumes heading in this direction uh, that haven't been addressed. Uh, and the, the ones that have, have been addressed by uh, the federal government in the federal Superfund program. Um, so I don't think there's any public health threat here. However, um, it would be uh, good for, for two things. Number one, um, in lieu of the water quality sampling, which I, you know, it would be nice to say go ahead and do it, um, but there's an awful lot of work that would be burdening this particular owner for the small area that we're talking about development that no one ever did. Yeah, I so think it I was, say, I think, Ed, it was for the nitrogen loading. And I did check that this area um, is, is in phase three of a sewering plan. Yeah. I'd rather people right. save their money f for the sewer. <laughs> I'm going to tell you they're on this Right, right. right. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, I'll everybody uh, else. So that, this is great. Um, but I would recommend that uh, since the, the individual homeowners have to drill a private well, that they just provide the same analysis they're going to provide the Board of Health to the town uh, planning board records uh, to prove that the water quality is uh, drinkable. Um, I, I think that's a good idea because they have tested wells there and they haven't been using them. But somebody can back up and say, hey, something happened to me because these wells were never tested and the town never pushed them on it. Yeah. So I think they should test your... Well, I think what, what Ed is saying is that these are not, it's not town water, so they have to do a private well. So there'll be a water potability test. They have to provide that to the Board of Health regardless. So a copy uh, can, that's a, what I was yeah, a copy can that, be sent to the planning board as well. Yard, yard. Okay. Can I have one more? That's exactly, yes, that's if, exactly if, what I'm saying. If correct. Ed's okay, I'll, I'm going to start to go to board members, and, and I know that people in the audience are nodding, and, and we, are, we will hear you. I, I'm sorry. I like to do this process for Okay. So that was that, that a copy. Thing. I just have one more thing. And uh -huh. what, what I just mentioned was mitigation for the water quality sampling. The second thing I was going to mention was mitigation for the thousand square, greater than 1,000 square feet of lawn. That is the requirement to um, for these houses to use organic slow release fertilizer only, not commercially available chemical fertilizer, organic slow re slow release fertilizer, or and or some of the um, other um, nitrogen fertilizer restrictions that um, Mark and I discussed yesterday. Mark, I don't know if you're prepared to talk a little bit about that at all tonight, but that those would be certainly acceptable as well. Yeah, we we provided a written document with those um, items in it, so we're happy to have um, that as a condition, you know, and, and and or condition, you know, to to add what we've already provided or organic slow release fertilizer. It's fine with uh, with us. So is that your proposed <clears throat> condition number eighteen? That's correct. 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 But if in lieu, of, if would the would the non -o the organic fertilizer be in lieu of that condition or or complementary to that? Um, or does it matter? <laughs> just in or you know either do these things you know or just certain the certain time of the year uh, no phosphorus etc cetera, etc cetera, or this the slow release. Uh, the slow release. How do you enforce that? Oh, um, a good question. <laughs> I, that's a great question because, as I say, I think some of these conditions obviously have not been enforced over the course of the uh, of right. the years. I mean, as I said, I did provide some. Uh, I mean, the best the applicant can do is two things: he can he can put the 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 pr prospective homeowners on notice, and then um, I did suggest language to be put in their deeds yeah, that. Um, that certainly could also include, uh, well, it's, this one said 
requires that any fertilizers, pesticides used shall be a type approved by the, t so that was in the original special permit. If, if the, the board instead wants to add the language about the non-organic, you know, we can certainly, I don't think we're opposed to putting it in the deed to put it on notice. Otherwise for enforcement, unfortunately, I think that would be either the building department or town planner. <laughs> Not me, I'm not an enforcement <laughs> agent. I have no enforcement authority. Uh, it would likely be the building commissioner. Right, the building commissioner would have to enforce it. You know, unfortunately with these conditions, I mean, there are a lot of conditions in this original special permit that are, you know, dealing with things that individuals, homeowners do. You right. know, they're supposed to use like, you know, non-calcium, uh, uh, you know, de-icing. And, you know, obviously no one from the town is going to go out there and knock at everybody's door and watch <laughs> them do these things. So unfortunately, you know, you do the best you can. And as I said, my clients are certainly willing to put them on notice of these conditions uh, as well, you know, either both verbally and, you know, through the uh, that language in the deed. That's all you can do. Right. right. You know, and obviously once he sells the homes, he's not, you know, monitoring what people are doing, uh, you know, on, for driveways and things like that. You know. It's, so, Ed, anything else? Thank you. Okay, so board members. Um, you're talking about Title V systems. Title V systems are gone. The, the state's going to do away with them. So if you put that, a Title V system in, in 10 years, so many years, you're going to have to put a new system in. Are you thinking about putting an alternative system in? You know, I mean, that's, this is coming down quick from the state because we got, they, they got sued, the state to clean this water up, just like in Boston. And and this is going through, so I don't understand why you're talking Title V when we have the new systems coming down. They, they probably need down before you finish building these houses. And they're gonna come to you and say, this is no good no more. So, um, you know, the obviously the final version of the Title V documents are not complete. Um, we're, as an engineering firm, we're always just taking calls and questions and our current clients are asking this question, should I be putting in a nitrogen reducing system now? Right. And, or will I just have to do it in five years or 10 years? I mean, I do know each town is gonna be able to create a water watershed shed permit. management right. permit, mm -hmm. which will extend out potentially- 20 years. In, 20 years. Instead of in five okay. years and 20 years to, to do this. But um, that, that only depends under that 20 years, the town's doing something. If they come, they come in five years and they say, okay, you're not doing this quick enough. Now you have to put these alternative systems in. So. You know, and then also this is under potential phase three of sewering, which could be 10 years. or 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's unknown as well. Um, you know, we basically, a, a response to this as an engineering company is, um, you know, consider it. But to condition it, uh, you know, we're hesitant to just. I'm not asking to yes. condition this. I'm just yes. thinking it'd be a wise move for you because you don't want to build a house in, in five years. The people say, I have to put a new system in. How come you didn't tell me? I mean, yeah. Well, I, I would think, you know, based on the public outcry of what's going on, I think most people would be pretty uh, well aware of, uh, you know, what, what may be coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. You know, at this stage, I think it's been pretty publicized. Would, right, would, would the owner accept uh, a condition that the homes are designed for easy s hookup to the sewer? Um, what, so what I'm hearing from people yeah, in yeah. neighborhoods that they weren't, de when the homes sometimes weren't designed, for easy hookup. They're like, my hookup has to go zigzag through my yard and go to the back and ruin all my landscaping. So I, I, I it's probably gonna be an unenforceable condition. Okay. But just as a reminder, um, I'm probably gonna suggest that condition just so your architect says, oh, you know, I, I should put these pipes here, I should, I, you know, yeah. I'm talking to a lot of people that are like, oh, I'm going to have to rip up my whole yard and why, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the nicest part of the yard I have to destroy to put these in, so. They have different ways to put the pipe in. They, okay. They yeah, drill, we'll, we'll definitely keep that in mind. They drill right. a hole. Yeah. And, and, like a, and the desire of the septic system, I'm like fully aware of that. Right. I'll just bring that up. Yeah. It's a good, yeah. yep. Anything else, Dennis? Nope. John? I'm good. Rob? The, the, um, regarding the, the uh, thousand square foot uh, lawn area, 
the majority of these lots are basically outside or in excess of that thousand yards. And, and the topographical uh, uh, presentation that you had, it, it looks like it's ideal for natural growth. Is that generally what uh, is expected? To, or can, can a homeowner extend that 1,000 feet to all lawn area? How much? I mean, it, it seems clear that most of the homeowners have done that. Um, you know, this developer is only proposing, a, you know, obviously he's looking for more than 1,000 square feet of lawn, but if you look at the topographical, I mean, the edge of clearing is pretty, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, uh, at least from this applicant, a lot of uh, natural vegetation being left. And, uh, you know, again, unfortunately, all we can do is advise the homeowners, um, you know, to, to do what they can you know, obviously we don't have any control 10, 20, 30 years down the road what somebody was going to do. But, you know, again, we're, we're proposing in the, de in the development stage to leave most of these lots natural. And just the, um, if you have that exhibit with the aerials, the two, the two lots above 41 are a relatively new lot, and the intention of the builder is similar like that. You'll see there's a, there is green lawn around the houses, mm -hmm. but it's about a 15 foot strip around the house. Um, you know, that's how these houses are going to be built. Um, once they're sold. But you would think that the, the, any owner that, would like to keep, keep a degree of privacy, uh, I, you know, in that regard. I anticipate a lively conversation about that condition of a yeah. thousand square so yes. <laughs> after we close the public hearing I have a feeling we're going to have a lively discussion no. with the board members right. okay so John are you I, I'm uh, Rob I'm sorry Rob are you all set so Karen would you like to yeah, go next last time the abutters were complaining about some of them <clears throat> trying to figure out which ones they would be I think one was on Windsor Way about the, the lack of trees and that their privacy is being disturbed you know this aerial looks like there are plenty of trees where where would that disturbance be so, so are you saying like what what are their proposed vegetated buffers yeah well yeah what yeah where was it that they were looking at now and what will be put there to give them that privacy so on the plan you're looking at if you look in the bottom right there's saxony drive mm -hmm. i guess you see that? Mm -hmm. So I think some of the abutters were those four houses along Saxon. You'll see uh, Haskell, Hutchin Ryder, Watt, Swanson. Yes, I got it. So I, it, I believe the majority of the discussion was related to those houses. So you'll see there's a 50-foot open space. So that is land that we don't even own. That's just open space that we're not touching at all. That's not even when part of When you say open space, is that treed or is it is it? it it's, it, it looks it, like it's all treed. It's yeah. treed in, unless those people themselves are encroaching on that open space. Mm -hmm. um, then you'll see our open space of three acres, which um, you'll see there's a 50 foot plus or minus dimension and then 145 foot plus right. or minus. So mm -hmm. that'll be another, so another 100 feet Almost that 200. is untouchable. Um, and then based on what I just talked about with the <laughs> approximate 15 foot, 20 foot lawn around these houses, and this is the intention, the way you see these houses, um, you'll see they match the three houses on Tudor Terrace. Um, you know, we anticipate from house to house, almost 350 feet. Um, so a natural vegetative buffer of Likely 200. The house is on feet. Saxony Drive. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, How about um, the houses on Tudor Terrace? So I'm looking at lot 42A. Mm -hmm. That that edge of clearance looks like it's going to go right to the lot line. Yes. Yeah, it's a it's a side lot line. Um, so what yes. would be what would be the setback? Uh, 15, the setback to the structure is 15 feet. And that doesn't have to be vegetated? No. no. Is there any requirement for a vegetated buffer? No. And, and that lot exists today as 42 anyways. 
um, on the original subdivision plan. So in a, a, a different shape, but there exists. I was going to say. Yes. So <laughs> is, is there, well, uh, we're going to have some more discussion about vegetated uh, uh, buffers. Um, and thank you for this plan, because you, you're starting. Speak to that one thing about that. The you know, can I have you use the microphone? I'm so sorry. Yeah, Just, yeah. I know people are at home okay, listening. I'm sorry, sorry. Um, I'm yeah, you. that's great. Just on the, Dan, on the Dan, make sure you introduce yourself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dan Masters, Pleasantwood Homes. Um, yeah, on the, on the existing lots, they are smaller lots. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they're tighter to the lot lines. With the larger lots that we're proposing, we'll have more space to leave a buffer yeah. in between the lots as mm -hmm. well. So that's part of the intent of the way the lot sizes and what we're laying out. So we can have a little more vegetated buffer. You know, as you can see, the proposed type of clearings. I mean, generally speaking, what we like to do is you know, 15 feet at least from the house. You need for working around it, and what we try to mm. leave is right. not much trees as possible. So right. the intent will to be to leave as many trees as possible for, for buffer on the larger lots. And we will have a little more of that luxury because of the sheer size. And I think what Mark's point was with lots 41 and 42, uh, if we weren't planning anything, they could be developed, you know, as they could be developed. So, but with the three additional lots, with the, it says the net gain of three, we're trying to give as much buffer as possible, and I, I would you know, suggest that you know, over 300 feet of, to the nearest home on Saxony is uh, more than enough um, you know, privacy. Yeah. And that was the intent of pulling yeah. it into the special permit so we could create more open space. Right. And we wouldn't need right. to use that space for Yes, I know. Right. Yeah. It's very I'm, I'm, what, what I'm, what I'm saying to you is very challenging, right? Yeah. You're already clustering it. <laughs> so you're not cutting down as many trees Correct. as if you didn't cluster it, right? right. right. Yeah. But we're in a water crisis here. Yep. Right, so I'm I'm trying to think up some type of condition where you're saving as many trees as possible, um, and um, I'm looking for. I'd rather have you suggest that condition, right, Th than than me. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah. I think I think it's pretty safe to say we're gonna we're gonna continue this hearing. Um, so there's some time for you to to think up what kind of condition. Um, you would put in here to save as many trees as possible. Okay. Is that is that okay? I think that's. Do you understand what I'm talking about, Mark? It normally, for a commercial property, right, would be talking about vegetated buffers. But here, this is a cluster subdivision, so it's kind of odd. I don't understand. He's leaving a lot of buffer already. Right. But I'm looking at the lot 42A. Yeah, but. But there. Can I make a suggestion? Be able to leave a lot more buffer. Than the existing subdivision itself mm -hmm. is a lot right because the lots because of the size of the lots, lots are bigger, a lot right. bigger. Yeah, and, it, and as you can see, we we, uh, we don't like to take down a lot of trees. Right. Uh, uh, but what would prevent? I'm sorry. Yep. But, uh, let me let me play devil's advocate. Yeah. You get this permitted, and then you go, I'm going to sell it. You got it permitted. I'm going to sell it. Mm -hmm. Right. Not saying that you're going to. Mm -hmm. What's to prevent the next developer from clear cutting the lots? Of of the forty thousand, you know, nothing. Right. Um, but if he could also extend the existing Tudor Terrace into this property and create two lots per normal zoning, and then you can clear cut everything plus the three acres right. being held in open space. But you guys don't want to clear cut. I just want to. I just want that somehow codified in the decision. I mean, I guess what you could say, I'm not going to obviously speak, but at least for the lots that are like 42A, 50, 49, you know, and 48, and even 41A, I mean, if you look, maybe you'd say, you know, I don't know how far that is, you know, you know, no, you know, you could put an edge of clearing line. Probably 50 feet. But he already did that on the houses. Yeah. No, right. Well, is that, but is that enough to prevent it from getting cleared? I like this plan. Don't get me no, wrong, yeah. Yeah. right? And that was the intent of the open space. But right? are you going? Are you? Is that really that line edge of clearing legally binding? No, no. 
Right. Well, if you put it as a, I mean, if you put it as a condition of the special permit, of the special permit it would be, yeah. I guess it would be enforceable by the building commissioner. Um, That's all. That's correct. So, so I, guess, I want you to think, I want you to re-examine that edge of clearing. Do you know what I mean? So that it's engineered. I think you drew it as a, as kind of like a swiggly that, line, that's, that's as estimated. What we propose to do, and that's normally how we would do it. That's that's how we propose. We just wanted to give you an idea yeah. Yeah. of what we yeah. were planning on doing. So you talked it, about a 15 foot lawn. Yeah, yeah generally speaking, we we like to clear 15. It all depends because what trees are where. Big trees. Sometimes yeah. we have to go a little bit further. But generally speaking, around 15, sometimes 20, if the case. And then usually in the back, we'll go 25 feet or so. Maybe 30 from the house, and that's it. And so, then, so is so. All right. So you that this is great. Yeah. So that edge of clearing, I just want to make sure that's correctly reflecting what you just said, so that we could put it in the decision. We can make it a condition of the special the permit. permit yeah. Well, I I might suggest if I may. Yes. Um, we're gonna li each sheet is gonna be referenced in a written decision at the board ops to approve this particular uh, proposal. Um, the inclu in inclusive of the sheet that it has a line for edge of clearing. I might complement that particular sheet with the dimension amenable to the applicant and acceptable to the board for the for disturbance from the rear of the structure, so that if 35 feet is adequate, then you do not allow okay. any clearing of any vegetation beyond, beyond 35, 35 feet, feet from the rear of the structure. That's, that's the Good. Way, yeah. Yeah. So did you just hear that he talked? So Evan, Evan suggested, go ahead, say it again. What I suggested to the board is if we can discuss an adequate dimension from the rear of any structure to be sited, maybe it's 30 feet, maybe it's 35 feet, we establish a limit of clearing from the rear of any structure to be sited. So we could say no more, no clearing beyond 30 feet beyond the yeah. rear of any structure to be sited. I, I think what I would prefer to consider, to be quite honest with you, if there was something it would be from the lot line. Okay. And like say a depth of the lot. Uh, yeah. What, know, or something of that nature. What if it was like another. Just so the back. That makes sense. Because I think if we start doing it from the structure and all that. Right. You have, they have due diligence water. considerations okay. to site yeah, the no, home and site a septic system. So things yeah. make uh, so variable. I would say like yeah. just take a nice, another like, I'm just 50. throwing a number out there. I'm not saying, <laughs> but like something like a, a 50 foot. From the lot line. From the lot line. Yeah. Just from the extra, rear lot line. From the, the rear lot line. Right. Just so an extra buffer. That's yeah. that's not going to do it for me for lots 48, 49, and 50. Do you know what I mean? That's a lot of trees you could still cut down. But it, uh, it's <laughs> I mean, that's a sizable buffer on top of what's there. If the intent is for just, I mean, it's the amount of trees, that's still, um, you know, that's still a good amount of trees that are being left left alone. And you're not saying you're going to you're going to come no, up no, to the no, 50 the feet. The intent would not be to go there, but it would right. just be as an extra buffer. And I think it's a lot easier to say from the real lot line. As I well. like Evan's proposal better. I do. Yeah, well, it, I, I don't yeah. want to be a devil's advocate. We could push pushes that we could yeah, push the houses the house 100 feet further back. Yeah, because the house is, you know, I mean, I, that's not, those are proposed. It's not written right. in stone. It's sometimes conditions make us push it back to. Like some of these, where we have to cite septics and stuff on the skinny part, yeah. we may need more space to push back. Yeah. So right. I think if we do it from the rear lot line, that's an established point that we can work off of. That does that's make, oops, sorry, Dan. It, that does make sense, I think, in terms of a condition. I think what um, when Mary said is 50, 50 feet from the perception of, of the chair is, is inadequate. Is there a dimension that would be more substantial beyond 50 feet that would be amenable to the project proponent? What if the rest of the board is okay with 50 feet? Yep, we'll have to have that discussion when we close the the uh, public hearing. But I would I would like to see something engineered that we can point to. Can I make one other uh, mm -hmm. comment relative yeah, to that yeah. to lot forty two A and the houses along? I think it's Windsor Way. Windsor Way, yeah. uh, where the edge of clearing uh, to what I'm looking at is the right of the proposed home is relatively limited. Where are you? I'm sorry. Say it again. Lot 42A, you had discussed um, how much clearing adjacent to the rear of those lots on Windsor Bay would, would occur. And the board in, in relatively recent subdivisions, in similar situations where new proposed subdivision lots, recognizing that 42A is not a new building lot, where you have, uh, in response to neighbors, uh, having a level of discomfort with new development to the rear of their properties where the board has conditioned the special permit, 
uh, on the installation of a residential style stockade fence along the portion of that property line. Perhaps if the, if the applicant were amenable to such a condition, the board could consider that for the benefit of those particular property owners. Um, and then a fence in addition to whatever landscaping the developer wanted to install would provide adequate screening from those neighbors along Windsor Way. Well, can I ask one other question though? Mm -hmm. the, the intent, is it for a screening purpose or is it some water other? Quality. Water quality. Water okay. quality. I'm talking about water quality. Yeah, so, but I think what we're doing with all the other aspects of the project, such as retaining roof runoff, uh, curating, keeping it from running, grading off into the road, I think all those steps, we're doing a lot more than all the existing homes in there already are. So we are taking that into consideration. So I think if by taking down more trees on those lots, we're still not gonna adversely affect the water quality as much as um, any other existing home out there. I, I, we're going far and beyond that too. So I would like to take that, the board to take that all into consideration when discussing a, any potential other limitation to the clearance, that's all. Okay, so who, who were we at, Karen? Yeah, Go ahead. Um, gosh, I don't know, I've asked these questions, but you know, I've always been really interested in wastewater, obsessively interested in it. <clears throat> you have uh, wells, individual wells dug, and then you have a septic system. Correct. What is the distance between those two? What is the it, legal? It, it's 100 feet. 100 feet, yeah. And Mr. Marson, why did you not get a better mint so you'd have, you know, town water? Because to, to me, the worry of well water is, is a bit scary. <laughs> that, that, that's not up to me. That would be up to the neighbors to bring it in, I think. Yeah, it would. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to do it myself. The neighbors would you'd have, have to get, well, you'd have yeah. to get approval, yeah. yeah. Did you seek that? It would be by petition I, of the neighborhood. Yeah, I don't think it would be <clears throat> practical. Anything else, Karen? That's it. Richard? No, I think it's pretty reasonable what they've, they've requested, actually. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> and I'm going to go and then I'm going to recognize. All right. So, I just want to thank you for your December 20th. Uh, correspondence about Spring Hill West subdivision. Um, unfortunately, this correspondence has not fully dispelled my concerns regarding the project's compliance with zoning. Okay. Currently, I'm forming the opinion that the proposed subdivision <clears throat> is new and thus needs a new and separate cluster subdivision special permit and approved plan per the current Town of Mashpee Zoning Bylaw, Section 174.47. And furthermore, um, no, I'm not gonna say that. So this zoning issue, this is new land. If you have five acres of land or more in town and you wanna subdivide it, you have to use the cluster subdivision, Section 174.47. And it has to be a new special permit and a new cluster subdivision. It can't be added. It's in my opinion, this is how I see it, it can't be added to an old special permit or an old cluster subdivision. I like this plan, but I need you guys to make a way that I can approve this. Because I don't see, in the, in the zoning document that you gave us, I don't see a, a zoning opinion saying how you can, you can add this parcel into this existing subdivision and, mute and permit it via a modification to a special permit. I see that it needs a completely new special permit and a completely new subdivision. Um, so I'm gonna ask uh, your council, there might be case law, right? There might be other examples in town where this has happened. There might be other examples on Cape Cod where this has happened or in Massachusetts. There might be something in Chapter 40A or 81T or some type of state statute that allows this, but I haven't found it. Um, so I'm gonna leave it up to you to prove it to me that you can do this, that you can roll this new six acres into the existing. And if our zoning bylaw doesn't allow it, what would we do to our zoning bylaw to allow it, right? If it's, not, if it's not allowed by the zoning, 
we sh the planning board should not be voting for it, even though we might all like this, right? But it sets a very dangerous precedent and it opens you up to um, legal liability, right? If you, have, if you have something that's not defensible in court, it's not gonna help you. So it's really worth spending the time to give me a, an, a, an opinion on the zoning, why this, can, this new lot can be per permitted via our zoning in this way, because I cannot see it. Well, why ain't this special permit that's existing still not existing? Go ahead. Can I, I can't see in the bylaw where it says you can add new land to an existing cluster subdivision. Why, why is it new? Is it, not, wasn't not. this still in that existing sub, the subdivision when it first was planned, or this is something that... This is new land that's being introduced into the okay. cluster subdivision. <clears throat> right. But and I like the strategy that you're doing, and I think it's, it's a pretty... Can we have evidence of... I think I just I'd like to think about this from a practical standpoint because nothing proposed today in the plan set you received tonight is inconsistent with today's zoning bylaw. Nothing about it. Right. Okay. So in the zoning bylaw, where does it say that you can add outside land into? You can do that with, by modifying the subdivision and the special permit. I don't think it explicitly says it, but doesn't so explicitly if it doesn't explicitly either. say it. It's not that. We, it in our zoning bylaw, no, in our zoning bylaw, if it's not explicitly allowed, it's not allowed. So I think just from my practical response is, then you approve this as a new subdivision. Right. So it You still need to modify the, the definitive from right. Springfield West. If you, if you do it as a new subdivision, it's going to have incredibly different lot design. So we, that... that uh, I would disagree with that uh, because the current subdivision standards actually grant you far more flexibility to establish the dimensional criteria of the subdivision. So uh, what is proposed, if you are amenable to the dimensional criteria on this particular plan, is perfectly adequate, adequate under today's zoning. I, I disagree with you. I asked for a legal opinion last time. It was a month ago. What I got was, was far from what I expected. Okay, well... Um, I was never asked at the last meeting to give an opinion as to why we went through the process the way we did. It was my understanding that I was asked to determine what whether we're using current zoning criteria versus existing zoning criteria, and that's what I addressed. Right. So I'm happy to address your question, uh, specifically the one that's been raised tonight. I said that was not what was raised the last time. Again, the reason we, were, we did the modification is because two of these, at least two of these lots, are part of the existing subdivision. Yeah. Right. So that's why I know. we modified it. But I'm contending that you can't do that. Okay. So I, I need you to give me the zoning opinion. Where in our zoning bylaw does it allow us to do this? And if the zoning bylaw doesn't allow that, what do we do to change the zoning bylaw to do that? Should we take a vote on this? Like you're, you're one person yeah. and you're demanding to do, do something. I'm asking but them. But you're right. not asking. And out of the board members. Yeah, I'm asking for a zoning opinion because what my intention is is to send it to town council. Because I'm not convinced that zoning allows for this. But we still have to vote on it, right? Yeah, yeah. A, we haven't closed the public hearing. And if, if basically, if you want my vote, I need to have a zoning opinion about it. If you want to ignore me and take a chance that somebody else will vote no, or you can earn my vote yes. I mean, it's up to you. It's 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 up to you. But at this point, I'm I'm for I I keep reading the bylaw, and I cannot see the avenue um, that they're going as being um, allowed by zoning. <clears throat> and I've thought about this a lot. Um, but I'm 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 giving you the chance to give me something to hang my hat on. Understood. Okay. So we vote after the public hearing? You have to close the public hearing. And if they provide, a, if, they, if they do choose to provide a, a zoning opinion and it goes to town council, we have to keep the public hearing open until uh, town council get back, gets back to us. And what are we gonna ask the town council to? It's a zoning opinion to see if this, if their proposed subdivision 
the way it is, is complies with our zoning. I don't want town council, I don't want the town, I'm sorry, but I don't want the town to spend its money doing that, researching that. I want them to do that. And it, I mean, usually zoning opinions are, are long and technical. Um, so, so if no other board members have any comments, I want to open it up to the public. We don't have the podium set up. So um, I think you're going to have to. Well, you guys have to get out of here. No. Yeah, I'll give move. up the, yeah. I guess I would just leave it. I mean, I mean, I guess you can take a, the temperature of the board. It, it, I think the subdivision approval only requires three votes. So, but if I don't have the votes, so I don't want to. But a special permit four. needs four. four. Correct. And I, I just, I'm always very conscientious of that because I don't want to surprise anybody no. and have, have a vote happen that, that could have gone a different way. Um, but anyways, is there anybody from the public that would like to comment? Yep, hi. Your name and your address, please. Hello. <laughs> hi, my name is Catherine Haskell. I live in um, Saxony Drive. And I spoke last time, and yeah. a few things came up tonight I wasn't really prepared, I wasn't even thinking about, but, um, was in, I'm just a person that lives here for, I don't know, how many years? 36 years. 36 years, and. Um, Point in time, you're a resident now, you're as yeah. important as everybody else, so yeah, go for so, it. so, um, <laughs> I don't have the background like the attorney had, so, um, and I, I find it kind of ironic how he noted that we've run out of time to have an association, but they can go on an old permit for the neighborhood, so I think that's kind of funny. But what I want to say, one thing about the um, the lawns, I don't understand the square footage, but I do know every time I take a walk out back during the um, self-imposed non-watering, during the um, drought, he was watering so much his $1.2 million houses that the water was just continually going down the drains for hours with no one around. So <laughs> if you're going to put in how many more lawns with that much watering and, you know. And the other thing I'd like to note is that you all don't really seem to know what the test wells are for. Um, when I, I can only tell you what I heard, but that um, there was some kind of a dump back there when I was um, what the builder that owned it before was saying. Now, when... <laughs> I was buying my land again. I was told by the builder that, that um, the land that Rudy owned behind me was landlocked. And then when I had called the town, when I saw people out there, like I said years ago, not when Evan was here, um, I was told that nobody would ever build out there. So the original um, 50 feet you see was the original 50 feet that was in our neighborhood, you know? And then we were told that the abutting people would have another 50 feet to add. So, you know, um, I am concerned about my well. My well is right there uh, at the lot line of the starting um, 50 feet of um, the original open space. And so, um, you know, I, I, I know we're not talking about elderly housing or low-income housing or anything. We're talking about, you know, we have this still two houses there for 1.2 million. And they were, one of them was bought with just the small size, so it's not like the person needed the extra um, thousands of feet, you know, and um, they still paid that much money for it. And, you know, um, I think the builder inherited that, so it's like he's making plenty of money. There's no, you know, we're not, if he could just give <coughs> us more open space, you know, and, um, and make it like cemented deal, not like, because clearly he's cut down almost every single tree to put those houses in on two-door terrace. There's a couple, and the first house, he's already cleared back into the open space and, um, 
the brush. And so I, you can, when you walk by Tudor Terrace, you can clearly see into the next person's lot, you know? Um, and the other thing is that a couple of years ago, we, we um, all came together and um, turned the, um, had the road overtaken by the town. Mm -hmm. So we all paid betterments at 5% interest over so many years of like, I don't know if it was seven or $8,000 a piece. And so of course, I'm expecting that the builder had to pay per, and it was divided up per home. So now we're gonna add three more homes that should go into the betterment to cut down what the people are paying for the roads. You know what I'm saying? Like if someone's, it's all divided by how many houses were in that neighborhood. Each person got assessed an amount, like 7,000 a home, and you were allowed to either pay it up front or pay it over so many years. But if that, those three aren't paying towards the betterment, it's like not really right to the other homeowners are, you know, times are tough. But okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was, um, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought we were being sued by the town of Mashpee was being sued by that group in um, Osterville. See. Yeah, and I'm really concerned about that. I know it was kind of like, uh, you know, pushed aside, but uh, should we be, I don't, I don't understand it all. I just don't know if we should be doing big projects like this, especially when you look at like Santuit, that is the place where, you know, one of the issues are, um, and it's really density, you know? So, you know, he, he's kind of not clear, at least to me, on where the setbacks, and then sometimes this could happen, and then these people could put pools in, and who's gonna enforce this? And it just doesn't seem like we have a concrete spot where they're gonna say, no, you can't build beyond here ever. You know what I mean? So that's not concrete to me. Um, I just wanna just check my... Um, and the other thing is, on the other map that I originally got from you, it said that there was no historical or archeological um, site work done. And I think in today's day and age, I don't know what your criteria is, but it might be a good thing to do. So, you know, just something to think about. Okay, so that's it for me. Thank you. If I could say anything? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ken, ha <laughs> Ken Haskell, 3 Saxony Drive. Uh, one, and we are an original owner in the, uh, in the uh, neighborhood. And I could, I could speak to a couple things. You, you know, you talked about the water a little bit. And my biggest concern is the water and the sewer systems. Uh, and as my wife mentioned, um, this was originally a private, and, 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 the, and the builder mentioned as well, this was a private uh, development. Unfortunately, went through tough times with the real estate, you know, back in the late 90s. Uh, and the uh, association did kind of fall apart, right? Because no one really took control of it. Uh, I think there were at least three different builders that built in there. Um, but that being said, so the town <coughs> did put in town water on Couture Road. And we lost the opportunity because we had uh, a private development and we didn't have uh, any, really any association, right? So we, we missed the ball. And the, then recently now we turned it over to the town and like I said, everybody pitched in their fair share uh, to have the town uh, come in and did it. they did a beautiful job. The road's beautiful. I love it. I like to roll a blade and it's nice and smooth out there. It's beautiful. But anyway, uh, we did not get the water put in. You know, and then now, like like the builder mentioned, it's up to the town to do that, I would think. You know what I mean? I don't know how that works. I don't know how it worked like on Couture Road. I mean, obviously there's no association in Couture Road, right? When we first moved there, there was no water on that side of town. There weren't any stoplights either, but that's a whole nother thing. But um, so, so, I mean, that's kind of where we are with the water. So we do have, you know, pro private sewer, drinking private water. water. Drinking water, yeah. yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, and it, to me, it's just a concern. As you build more houses, we already have a trouble with nitrogen. Santua Pond is a hotbed for it. Uh, plenty of neighborhoods over there. So just, just something that, and I'm glad to see that um, you folks did look at that as part of the, uh, as part of the new development. Um, that's about all I had to say, just some clarification points. Again, <laughs> concern about uh, water for the most part. 
drinking water. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And Evan, remind me, the preliminary subdivision plan was submitted to the Board of Health, the Health Department. And I believe the, the, the subdivision was, I, I believe, also the definitive was filed with the Board of Health as well. And they did not provide any comments? If, if I remember at the time of the filing of the definitive, they, lock, they lacked a quorum to take a vote on the definitive filing. So the health agent made a recommendation to approve. Okay. And would he have looked at things like, was there enough room for drinking water wells and septic systems? I believe that would be within the scope of the Board of Health, yes. Would you mind checking with him? Certainly. Just, just to address that. It's a new that. health agent, but I can certainly bring it up with a new health agent, yeah. Yeah, just, just, um, j just to, so we can address that point. Certainly. Hi. Yes, I am, but there's somebody that's ahead of you. Hi. Hi there, Stephen Ferreira, 11 Saxony Drive. Uh, I was at the previous meeting and I spoke, and I, I pretty much have the same points that I spoke the last time. Um, Why don't you remind us? Because okay. that was a while. Yeah, my wife and I we bought we bought our home four years ago on Saxony Drive, and one of the you know, deciding factors on why we purchased this home was the beautiful woods behind our house that that we always feared as soon as we moved in that developers would come in and cut the trees down, and um, you know I think. I've heard tonight that they've made some, you know, they want to try to preserve that, but there's no guarantees that, you know, this house gets sold and then the, the new owners decide to cut all the trees down. And once the trees are down, this, you know, there's no remediation for that, you know, I got to wait 40 years before trees grow back in. So I'm just concerned about that. And then, you know, I, I didn't measure anything, but I, you know, I looked at uh, Tudor Terrace, this, the circle there, it visually, it looks smaller than the Saxony Drive circle. And there's only like two or three houses on Saxony Drive. And here we're proposing a change from the existing design to add six houses around the circle, which none of the, none of the circles in this neighborhood have more than two or three houses. So it really doesn't meet the current look of the neighborhood. And you know, these houses would basically be six driveways off the circle to houses back in the woods. And you know, I really don't think that really is what we should be doing. So I think we should be trying to preserve the woods that are there. And, and the way the neighborhood is today, so. Can I just have, um, Mark, can you just show him on the colorized plan there? Maybe you can show that the, you marked out the difference, uh, the distance to Saxony. You, sir, you might be able to identify your home. Okay, uh, this looks like, uh, this right Saxony. here, okay, right here, I'm here. So you this see. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've provided the existing 50 foot open space that's not part of our land. Mm -hmm. And then we're proposing another three acres um, of open space. So a total of 150 feet that cannot be touched. Um, and then, you know, our to limit driveways, the intention is houses located approximately in those locations, resulting in 300 and 60 feet. Um, the question regarding the cul-de-sac, I mean, there's one, two, this might be an open space parcel. Open space, yep. Uh, so three houses with two more. We basically have, I mean, two, there's, uh, however you look at this, we might have four, there's three That's there. five, five to the three here. And, and even over here, you only have three on the, around the circle. Yeah. So, so uh, there, like, there, you know, there, there's more, there's more open space behind you. Um, yeah. I just wanted Mark to point that out to you. Okay. Other, I agree. Other still, people, other people are closer. But um, the but next, I, the next owner could could clear that. They don't. I mean, what's to stop them from from clearing those woods? Um, Even the we're, the, we're mar the place that's marked open space is going to be deed restricted conservation, and nobody's going to be able to chop down those trees. And if they do, they're going to have a big problem with the town. Also, what abuts your land is town of uh, town mm -hmm. of Mashpee land. Yeah, but and if they, you, if those owners clear those woods, they won't. Well, there's 150. Then there's no. There's no. I mean, <laughs> what happens? There's 150 feet. That yeah, it, they in get, they get in big trouble. Feet. Yeah. If what they, does it mean, though? What does that mean? They're uh, in big trouble. Yeah. They have to yeah. plant you know. trees. They get yeah. fired. You know, I'm 65 years old. <laughs> those trees, I'll be They're 90 before those trees grow in. No, so I can't. I, yeah. I think you're making them, you're worrying about something that's not going to happen. I think you're in a okay. better position. Uh, okay. But anyways, thank you. That's my point. Yeah. 
Okay, okay. good. I appreciate it. Thank All you right, for your thank you. Thank All you. right. Is there anybody else from the public that would like to comment? Yes, sir. In the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the man in the plaid, the red and black plaid. And just as a reminder, your name and address, please. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mike Cannon. I live at One Snee Drive in Mashpee. I actually came weirdly today to hear more about the old Barnstable project, but listening, I just felt compelled that it might be a good opportunity to share some information. So I live in a Pleasantwood home. I've lived there for about three to four years in the Quashnet Valley Estates, and I wanted to kind of help to understand the real world implications of decisions that might be made down the line. So I'm gonna make some assumptions here if I'm incorrect on it, I apologize. Um, so in front of my house, there's a flood every time there's a large rainstorm. Um, pretty significant. It goes up about a half length of a car door, around there. Um, most people probably drive around to other entrances of the neighborhood. I under, unfortunately cannot because my house sits right in front of it. Um, at the time, I called out DPW, and DPW did respond. Their answer to me, unfortunately, was, we need to begin to dig up your yard, which was quite alarming to me. I didn't really want my, my yard dug up. Um, I had actually observed the, the flooding situation, and I knew that it was runoff from the Quashnet Valley Golf Courses. I could see the river every time it ran. Um, so the assumption was is that the construction of my house diverted water from the Quashnet Valley runoff into the street. DPW's response was, well, we have two catch basins. That's all we need. It's enough. We've done the study. Um, I begged them, and I said, please, I'm telling you it's coming from the golf course and I don't know what to do. I'm the homeowner and I'm just stuck in the middle. So they placed sandbags along the road, hoping that I was right, and lo and behold, the flooding stopped or at least slowed significantly. Um, I've gotten into the routine now of going out there with my rake when it, when it rains quite hard and trying to free the catch basins up as much as I can. But all I would say is, as you're looking into these things, just understand that there can be real world impacts. I know that reports are great. I work in insurance. I look at engineering reports all the time. I know on paper everything sounds good, but at this time, it's my problem to deal with, and I deal with it the best I could. I'm hoping that DPW ends up talking to the golf course about what happened, and I, I'm sure that at some point there was some sort of grading plan for my lot that was approved, probably by this very board, but at the end of the day, um, I'm not trying to complain, I've been dealing with it for a while now, but at the end of the day, it's, it's my issue to deal with, and it's my little flood in front of my house. Um, and. My hope and dream is that DPW will somehow figure out with Washington Valley Golf Course that they can figure something out. But um, ultimately, I just thought, like I said, I was actually here to hear more about Old Barnstable, but hearing about all this and living in a pleasant one home, I just felt like it was a good idea just to share my experience and let you know that down the line, it can just end up with the homeowner and even know uh, plans and everything are approved. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else in the public? Tom. Hi, your name and address for the record, please. Yep, name's Tom Fadala, 60 Will End Road, town planner for 33 years, including the town planner that wrote the special permit for Spring Hill. Also wrote the current cluster zoning bylaw for which won a state smart growth award. You cannot expand on a 1988 cluster subdivision by adding additional land that was owned by a totally different person, Rudy Diaz, at the time that the subdivision was originally done. There is no process for that in the town zoning bylaw. This is a brand new subdivision. It needs to conform with the, the current cluster subdivision regulations and the town bylaw, which requires that any subdivision over five acres is a mandatory cluster subdivision requiring a special permit from the planning board. Its own special permit, not trying to tag on to a 1988 zoning special permit. So I don't know anything about, you know, whether the subdivision is good or not, but the process is not good. This is not a modification of a subdivision. It has to be a brand new, I mean, a modification of a special permit it has to be a brand new special permit under current zoning. There's very specific procedures in the current cluster development bylaw um, that should have been followed but probably weren't and probably too late for that now. I'm not commenting on the content of the, the plan, it's just the process is off. This hearing is Ill illegitimate. Uh, you really need to ask the applicant to withdraw and start over again with a brand new cluster subdivision under the current zoning bylaws, not zoning that was eliminated by town meeting in 2006. So that's my statement. Uh, 
Okay. It's just impossible. You can't, you can't do this. You, you can ask for an opinion from the owner's lawyer. He can come up with something. I doubt it, but uh, it's, it's just not, there's, there's no way. There's nothing in the statute, nothing in case law that says you can add anything to an existing old 1988 special permit property. So, any questions? Thank you for that. that yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, this is a, this was not. I'm, I'm this, concerned the, the about that. The original subdivision was done by Dan's that. brother Kenny, yeah. and you know he did Spring Hill West, and you know that was it. And uh, he tried to buy the land from Rudy at the time, and Rudy didn't want to sell it. Matter of fact, Rudy was uh, <laughs> harassing me for for years about Ken trying to steal his land because he had a property boundary dispute with uh, with Ken, and uh, Rudy has uh, since passed away, but. Uh, um, this is just a whole new subdivision. And um, um, I was curious whether or not the street had been taken by the town. Since the streets have been taken by the town, they have a right to use the streets in Spring Hill and Spring Hill West to access their subdivision. But beyond that, there's no connection between the two properties. And so they can't be permitted that way. Can I go back to my home now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I happened to turn on after Zelensky's speech, and there you guys were talking about modifying an old special permit, which you can't do. There is one special permit in town that you've been able to modify, and that is the Willowbend special permit, because the original special permit allowed for a certain number of housing units. And the bylaw provides for expanding you know, that subdivision onto, say, the the, whatever the number of units they want to uh, do on the, the five acre property that Six. was coming there, whatever it is, um, you know, until they hit the max on their special permit number, they've been able to do that. But no other, no other special permit in town like that, and certainly not this one. This is just a straight subdivision. All the lots they could get were got out of that property. And uh, I, again, I don't know if they're, uh, I got an impression that they might be expanding on lots in, you know, there's additional things that are not buildable lots in this plan. There's three buildable lots, I understand it, which would have to be based on the total square footage of the new property, the property that uh, Dan owns, and, uh, and divide that by 80,000, which is the current minimum lot size, and that's how many building lots they can have. But uh, there's no reason you can't take little pieces of land that are not building lots and label them not a building lot and it can also you probably should have language on there to if, if you're planning to transfer them to some other owner again i'm not clear on what's going on with the uh, the subdivision but uh, you you can label some unbuildable lots on there to be transferred to the adjacent lot at some point uh, and by the way the uh, the water quality Reporting that was this is in the 1980s before we had a water district before we had and certainly a sewer commission um, And the town was uh, is particularly through the Board of Health actually that was requiring and asking that the planning board put in these monitoring wells uh, And they were to monitor nitrogen for drinking water issues um, uh, oh. Not had nothing to do with the base this area is nowhere near any kind of plumes from the base as Ed was talking about there. This is no connection with the base, but it's uh, it was when we were concerned about drinking water and before we had a public water system. It was just getting started at about that time. So, um, and uh, the unfortunate thing about the thousand square foot, which you know it applied to the uh, previous subdivision and some others in town, was that so the thousand foot lawns. What's that? The 1,000 foot lawns? Yeah, 1,000 square foot lawn. Okay. The intent was to minimize the amount of fertilizer that went in the ground. And whatever kind of fertilizer it is, if you got 10,000 square feet of lawn, you got a hell of a lot more fertilizer going to the groundwater than you do on a 1,000 square foot patch of lawn. But that seems to have been violated everywhere in town. And as you know, the only zoning enforcement officer in the town is the building inspector or commissioner or whatever and his staff. So um, that's how a lot of those things disappeared. Uh, there were other subdivisions that had water quality monitoring that they did. They hired 
their uh, water quality consultants to report to the board and eventually they came to the board and asked for modifications of their special permit so that uh, they were relieved of that requirement and, and uh, for example, Asher's Heights, yeah. they were relieved of the requirement, but they had to leave the monitoring wells in place, uh, which were actually used in the development of the groundwater models for the sewer plant. So, um, and the, there was a number of subdivisions like this. But uh, um, in any case, that's Thank all you. that's flowing out of my mind right now. The problem is they really have to start all over again with a new special permit, a new application, because uh, this should just be withdrawn. and. Uh, it, it may be a good subdivision, looks good, but you can't do it. You, you can't just say, you know, because I'm going to vote to approve this. You, you don't have the authority. Town meeting decides what the zoning is, and town meeting has decided that the zoning is different than what you're trying to apply here. So. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public that would like to take this opportunity? Hi, sir. Hi. Yep, you. <laughs> I don't know you guys by name yet. <laughs> Hi. Hi, my name is Patrick Swanson. I'm at uh, number nine Saxony, and I'll be very brief because this has gone on quite a while, but I would just say that I am, we, we've lived there about 20 years, and we always knew that there would be development on Tudor. Um, my feeling is that this particular proposal um, is maybe biting off a little bit more than should be chewed on, and uh, uh, perhaps reducing some of these lot sizes, like cutting 47 and or cutting 48 and 49 in half and combining them into one, um, might be a little bit more in keeping with the neighborhood. Just in keeping the lot sizes down, maybe fewer lots because five around that cul-de-sac would be a lot of driveways. Um, so, but that's, yeah, so I'm kind of opposed to this the way it is. I'm not opposed to them building houses, they're fine houses, but, uh, that's basically all I wanted to say. All right. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very Chair. much. Anyone else from the public? Okay. Okay. Well, it's 10 past nine. I think we should continue this. Yeah. Okay. Um, Make the most of that. I would ask at the very least to the second meeting in January, not the first one. So that's January 18th. So I'm making a motion to continue this public hearing until January 18th at 710. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Would the town planner accept uh, comments? Um, uh, during this time period from the public and board members? Always. Okay. All right. So I'll take a, 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 everyone is in agreement to post, uh, to, uh, sorry, continue this public hearing to these, both of these public hearings to January 18th, 2023 at 710. Say aye. 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 Anyone aye. opposed or abstaining? Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. Merry you too, Christmas. Chris. You too. Thanks. Why don't you be notified of this meeting, this next meeting? Because we're not notified of this one. Sir, the, the meeting was just continued to January 18th at 7:10. Will, will there be a meeting? No. Mail? There will not. So people who did not attend this meeting won't know about that meeting, right? It'll be posted on the planning board's agenda for the requisite meeting. Planning board agenda. Thank you. Can, can we start a web a page for this, or are you guys? Uh, how you there should already be a page for this. Can you um, put a notice on that page? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Why didn't I get this? It was just submitted yesterday. Probably in your email. All right. So, um, if if everybody's good to go, we'll continue on with old business. <laughs> Discussion regarding applications submitted to the Community Preservation Committee for funding in May 2023. Um, we, we just continued the public hearing, Tom. Yeah, it's just about the uh, submitting comments to, to Evan. Those have to go on the public record, so you'd have to read them out at the next public meeting because they've got to be available to the public comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other advice, Tom? Thank you. 
Jesus Christ. So what we'll do, but um, it, it right? Yep. I know. Can I ask a question? Yep. Why so, did we? Why did we continue the public hearing? The, the lawyer asked for. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Because I asked him for information. I for, asked him for information. For what information? For a legal opinion about the zoning. So his attorney is going to come back with a legal opinion. I'm asking that, yeah, and um, yeah, and we we can't if we close the public hearing, we didn't have to vote tonight. We could take all our information and digest it and come back and uh, deliberate at a different time. But if you, I, I'm feeling that I need I I'm I'm tending towards feeling like I need to talk to town council. How does everybody else feel? John, that's the way the Madam Chair is doing it. I'm going to ask for town council. And I would, I would honor that request from anybody else. So and we I, find, I find this out of order. So we're going to continue on with the agenda. So could we have made a motion to approve with conditions or whatever? You made the, the, right now, the status is that you made a motion to continue the public hearing. Yeah, no, I'm just asking. Right, so I, I, you could ask the chair to entertain a motion to close the public hearing, but that didn't happen. So any, any future motion would have to be considered by the chair and recognized by the chair on January 18th. Okay. And you were chair, so you know that. Well, just want to know. I thought the lawyer asked for the continuation. No, he didn't. He said? No. Oh, okay. What I didn't hear was an objection. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah, so we should have objected. Yeah. I didn't hear an objection. I was hope this morning. All right. Yep. Next time. Um, and and Evan, I, I don't let me forget, but we have I have to read in to the record anything that came in in writing. And there were some things that came in in writing that I haven't read into the record. So don't let me forget to do that. All right. Um, old business, discussion regarding applications submitted to the Community Preservation Committee for funding in 2023. Um, so at this point in the agenda, you know, if there's anybody that wants to say anything about these items, uh, just raise your hand and let me know, okay? Um, uh, so anyways, I was looking for some guidance from uh, board members I'm the planning board's representative to the Community Preservation Committee uh, regarding the purchase of nine Santuit Lane. Um, we have heard from uh, the owner of the property. Uh, the members of the Community Preservation Committee got a correspondence that they have an offer on the property um, that's been accepted and is contingent on some type of due diligence. But anyways, I still would like to hear from um, the planning board members about Nines into it Lane if the town should uh, purchase it or not. Hi, Karen. Think, um, Madam Chair, that uh, Mr. Sharkey, who owns that property, has got a, a, a viable purchaser, but there could be so many contingencies that might not go through. That's, I did see that letter. <clears throat> but the point uh, that I was thinking about as I said last time, I went over to that property to look at it, and I know there's conservation land owned by the town contiguous with that property. Yes. So it sounds like a good thing to have, like trails and all. It sounds mm -hmm. good. But my thinking is Microphone, this. Please. Oh, I beg your pardon. It, it sounds like a good thing because it's contiguous with town land and we could have trails and it. It's, it sits on Santuit Pond. The problem I have with it are several, several matters. One, there's that house on it that really has to be torn down. I walked over it. I was afraid to walk on the porch. I thought I would fall through. So it's really bad. I mean, this is a real- Please don't go on the property, anybody. <laughs> okay, that's number one. Yeah, you shouldn't be on the property. Right. Oh, no, you're right, I shouldn't. Well, I was just looking at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, imagined it. <laughs> I imagined it, yes. I, I looked at it and I said, this wood is rotten and my weight would fall right through. The other thing, um, I talked to Selectman, select woman Colombo, and she had told me as a, that my information was wrong 
that the cyanobacteria over there does not go airborne. I would love to know, has there ever been a study about that? Because my thinking is, why would somebody want to walk through trails if they're getting airborne cyanobacteria? And I've got other information about cyanobacteria, which I have shared with staff, town staff, not in that pond, but another pond. It's kind of scary. So I wanted to know, is this airborne or not? Number three, it's a dirt road that takes you to that property. I, I heard that somebody, a member of the audience, thought that road was a lot better than my road. <laughs> but I don't think it's a very bad road. Santuit Pond Road is, is a pretty good road there. But it's not really conducive to having people going, parking over there. There's, they'd have to build a parking lot. There's no... So what do you think, A or nay? The, the answer is no. Okay. It's, it's without <laughs> doubt no, whether you know the candidate who's yeah. looking to purchase buys it, that's great. But uh, I would like to know if we have, if you know the answer to this, if anyone knows the answer, does, has there ever been any testing of that air quality over there to tell us that that does there not hasn't. go airborne? Um, I'd any, like to know if the porch would mm have -hmm. held your weight. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry. Anybody else? A or nay? Yes. I, I, I too, uh, visited the property. I saw Did you go on the porch? No, no, no. no. I never got out of the car. <laughs> uh, but I drove over. No. Uh, I am a nay on town ownership of that property. I don't think it serves the town's purpose of... Uh, Anybody else have an opinion? Whether like no opinion, yeah. neutral, neutral, I'm neutral. Over the rest. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, regarding seven fifty one Main Street, which which was an application put in by the planning board, and the planning board, you know, wrote a letter of recommendation. Um, we went into executive session, so I can't tell you. But um, anyways, <laughs> we, we, the big thing there is we didn't vote no. So we went into executive session. All right. Um, I have nothing else about any community preservation committee applications this time. Next item, local, oh, does, yes, Lynn. Uh, Lynn Barbie, Surf Drive, um, and I do sit on the community preservation, and I did drive past nine sand to it. I did not get out of the car. Um, <clears throat> uh, I don't know how the, we at the town could use that piece of land, but the idea that somebody would buy it and try to put a septic tank in there is horrifying to me. It's not a big piece of land. Yes, the house is definitely falling apart, and I didn't even get out of the car, and I could tell that. Um, but I guess the question is, does the, and there was an issue of the private road. Can you have public conservation land on a private road? I think, I guess the question that I would say is, it's not a big piece of land. They may not get anybody to buy it, because there's lots of problems with it. But to, to have preserved open space there has a certain value. Um, I mean, I don't know how much we would be able to pay for it or whatever. So I guess the, the question is, is if, <clears throat> if we don't take it, if, if they don't sell it and we don't take it, um, somebody else may. And, then that would it's going to be a mess because it's a very thin strip of land. It's right <clears throat> there are houses all around there, big houses like right next door, um, and I just think that people. Uh, I would hate to see somebody try to build a house there and put in a septic there because. It's right on the water of Santuit. And so can, can, is it possible for us to have a piece of land that's just 
conservation space, an open space that is not designed to be trails for people to walk on if that creates a whole other problem. It, it's a dilemma. I'm not saying, yes, we should buy it. I just think that you know there's a question of, of preserving real open space that is contiguous to one of our most polluted ponds. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm looking at the audience. We had one gentleman that was interested in the old Barnstable Road item. I think that's, um, that's under the town planner report. Does anybody mind if we jump to that? Please. Okay. Town planner report, affordable housing project 209 Old Barnstable Road. Good to see you, Mike. Thanks for coming in. I met with Mike um, a week and a half ago or so, two weeks ago. Um, my office has submitted notice to every abutter within the Quashan Valley Estate subdivision, every condo owner of the Quashan Valley condominiums, and every homeowner along Old Barnstable Road relative to uh, the intention of the Affordable Housing Trust to procure a developer for 209 Old Barnstable Road as affordable housing. Um, that's what uh, Michael and I discussed, and he's on one Snead Drive, so it was very close abutter to this particular project. Mm -hmm. Uh, what my no, what my letter to the neighborhood essentially indicated was that I'm in I'm intending on leading a community engagement process with uh, the, with the neighbors. I actually met with a representative of the neighborhood association yesterday informally. Uh, he was introducing himself because apparently the association has met and has um, nominated some of their memberships to be direct points of contact, uh, and beyond that. Um, be involved in the development of an RFP and, and seated on any RFP review committee who would be recommending an award of a contract or of the project to the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, hmm. What I've indicated to the neighborhood is that the, they'll, they'll be hearing from me regularly, but ultimately we'll hold a, a, at least a series of uh, workshops, just like our comprehensive plan, to identify um, what are the site design considerations, what types of housing could you support on this particular site. Um, what are the traffic concerns? What are the screen, screening concerns? What, what, what are the issues we can uh, understand in its totality to, to mitigate any of those potential impacts in the, uh, in the development by controlling that in the RFP itself and subsequently any development agreement the town would enter into the town? So the purpose of this particular agenda item was just to update the planning board that I formally noticed the, neighbor, the neighborhood of the process um, the process is still evolving, and I'm, I'm waiting to establish my, my direct points of contact. But um, we have the abutters list, you know, this custom abutters list, where once I'm able to identify dates, times, mm -hmm. and the scope of any engagement series, we'll be again notifying the neighborhood and inviting them to participate at that at that launch, which I anticipate would be uh, in early spring 2023. I'm, I've been saying March, which seems feasible to my office. Good. Okay, so. Anybody have any comments on that? We're not that we're not going to be the the people making that decision. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you do. Yeah. And you're on TV. I mean, yeah. people like are going to see you in the supermarket. Go, hey, I know you. Okay. <laughs> so this I have very incomplete information on. So you got to bear with me on it. Uh, all right. So. My understanding is that the plan for the low-income housing was planned for Commercial Street in, near Mashpee Commons, near Marshalls. The issue became that title issues were not worked out timely because of general counsel did something or didn't do something. The pivot to Old Barnstable is of concern for me for several reasons, obviously, property value, traffic studies, et cetera. The bigger issue that I have is just the pivot. There's available property on Commercial Street. I also understand there's available property behind, behind Town Hall, but there's a sewer line issue. And the town hasn't really looked into doing anything in affordable housing in seven years. So it seems odd to me that, oopsie, we made a mistake on the title issue. Let's run and jam this through to put something on Old Barnstable when the, all, the entire time we were originally focused on Commercial Street anyway. I understand title issues will take time to work out. But it seems odd from a resident standpoint. Of course, I'm sure there's other residents that will come and give their view as well. Um, it seems odd from being a resident standpoint that we're going to bypass two other viable properties in the, kind of the sense of the need for affordable housing in Mashpee when we haven't really done anything in seven years. And the title issues could have been foreseen by yeah. council and, and dealt with ahead of time. So it feels like a 
So kind this, of a, this a wing, lot, this like lot I, I, from what I can, what I understand, mm -hmm. and I don't sit on the Affordable Housing Committee or the Affordable mm -hmm. Housing Trust, this lot is actually further along towards development than the other two. It is, and, and it was because it's been inspected and the, cleared. The barrier was mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood resistance. Mm -hmm. So that's that's our town planner bravely and courageously <laughs> is going to have meetings mm -hmm. to see if that can get resolved. So, um, and if the overwhelming response from the community is not for resolution, the the trust owns the land. The Affordable Housing Trust owns the land, right? It's That's already correct. been through town meeting. Yeah, just a few points of clarification, yeah. um, and I've discussed this with Mike. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that the pivot was logical for yeah. 209 Old Barnstable Road is that every affordable housing project we have in our pipeline, including the one that we are about to, that the developers at 950 Pelham Road are about to close on, we pursued a feasibility analysis on. So we could provide the data to a developer to a expre express the, ta the town's interest and intent to develop it, but provide them with valuable data to adequately respond to the RFP. No other site in our pipeline had a completed feasibility analysis yeah. on it. This one was already transferred to the Affordable Housing Trust and approved by town meeting for the particular use and already has a feasibility analysis for it. So it's well positioned for development. But if not for the mistakes of the town, you'd be talking about Commercial Street right now, correct? Well, to be yeah, fair, Mr. Hannon, we were, it's in Commercial Lake Street Court. came about when we were going to proceed with the feasibility analysis. Mm -hmm. So we didn't even get to complete the feasibility analysis. Why would you proceed with the feasibility mm -hmm. analysis on Commercial Street? We're not gonna argue, it's yeah. just, just that's, that it's in land court. This it, it's just going to be there for a long time. So the best thing I can do is just rally my neighbors and community overwhelmingly to not support this. No, I think hearing. you should come to the meetings and and learn and, about it. I mean, I'll come if you want <laughs> and help. But I think you, we we need the neighbors' input about. I'd say participation is yeah. is welcomed. Yeah, even in from the position you yeah. are taking, Mr. Hannah. We want all the neighbors to come. Right. Yeah. And if they overwhelmingly do not support it, what would happen? I this this board doesn't have jurisdiction over it. Okay. So you know what I'm saying? Like um I don't. But, so so but it'll probably be permanent via a chapter forty B, mm -hmm. a friendly forty B. Mm -hmm. So that goes to another board that goes to the zoning board of appeals. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I think what Mike is asking is if the neighborhood after this engagement uh, sessions uh, resulted in overwhelming dissent with the proposal. Would the Affordable Housing Trust proceed? Yeah. And that I'm not able to respond that's, to. That's a that's a nine member uh, entity, mm -hmm. so you'd have to ask them. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to misspeak, and and you know. Um, no, I understand. Yeah. I do understand what you're saying, and I do understand that there's de there's decisions that can't be made or whatnot. I guess I think that. I'm confused on the purpose of speaking today. Would oh, I just, I just, I just have, a, I just have public comment. Okay. On yeah. anything. On anything. On anything. Including Old Barnstable. Yes, because yes, it was on our agenda. Okay. And you had mentioned that you were here for Old Barnstable, so. Yes. Yeah. So it's just for the record. Yeah. Okay. I'm good then. Okay. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Mike. We like to know what the town planner is doing. So this is the so he gives us reports. We tell Ed to go home. Oh, Ed, yeah. yeah. Ed, are you waiting for a certain item? I, um, no, I just thought I um, I was just actually texting Evan. I have uh, an early wake up for shoulder surgery in the morning. So oh, God, I'll love you. Say good night. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Thanks for seeing Ed. You're good. Bye. Bye. Happy New Year. All right, guys. All right. Thank you. So Happy this, New Year. We'll talk bye. to you later. Bye. And bye. Evan, I'll be in touch next week about um, um, the new Seabury Cottages phase three, okay? We're good. Yep, Ed, I'll, I'll follow up with you and connect you on that uh, with all the requisite individuals for that. Okay, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Right. Um, Has his meter been running since he's been on the... I don't yeah. know. Oh, my God. Uh, I don't know. All right, so Adam said, it's costing us money. <laughs> okay, so um, if nobody else wants to talk about Old Bostable Road, we'll go on to Aukway Highland tripartite agreement update. I wanted to uh, r report Bye-bye, see you. Thank you. I wanted to report on, on Aqua Island's tripartite agreement with you for one reason, and it was um, the Willow Circle subdivision that you recently approved is considering using a tripartite agreement as a method of security for that subdivision. And they asked me for 
um, copy that they could use as a draft template um, so that I, I could provide that to town council if that was the method of security they wanted to do. So the only tripartite agreement you're currently holding as a method of security is Aqua Highlands. So I took it as an opportunity to review that agreement. That agreement had some very clear timelines in it. One, it, the subdivision was supposed to be completed by April of last year, um, and also that the developer would make, I want to say, annual reports to you or biannual reports. So I just wanted to invite the developer to come in to oh, give good. us a status report. And, um, and then consider the tripartite agreement, it might need to be modified given that the dates have lapsed. Mm. Thank um, you. Oh, maybe you can ask them to get, draft up some new milestones and dates. Indeed. So um, I just wanted to put that on your radar and, and invite them in for a future agenda. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, let's go back. Local comprehensive plan updates with Weston and Sampson. Survey update. So survey's rolling. We've been getting pretty, pretty, I would say, adequate responses. We'd like to see more. We're, we're floating around 400 responses now. Great. Um, I, I'm going to keep working and really I'm hoping to squeeze out 700. I was trying to double up uh, let the, re the response rate from 98, uh, which was around 660. Yeah. Um, we're going to be floating around that figure. Can we remind people that it's out there? The, every, there are a few things that I know is working, and it's when the schools post something on Facebook. That seems to be working. Um, the, when flyers got home in backpacks, that seems to be working. So we're going to keep doing this, yeah. particularly on around the holiday. The way I'm framing it is do this with your families as a holiday activity. It's super yep. exciting. Right. Um, and then after the new year, we can say, hey, and so we got a new week, year resolution. Get involved week in your after community. the new year. So um, we've, it's steady progress. I mean, the, the, the peak day, I think, was 60 responses. The second peak was 48. Generally, we're seeing around 10 to 20 responses a day. Um, so keep keep pushing your neighbors to do it. The, know, keep doing it. Keep reminding the mean, everybody. everybody. The mean response time is 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 less than twenty five minutes. So it's That's good. It's, it's not That's a major good. ask, um, and it's estimated? it's hugely important for people to participate. So we're going to keep doing what we're doing and do what we know is working. And particularly around the holidays, we want to um, hammer it home a couple more times. It's called a town meeting. I know. Yeah, I, was like, I know. All right, workshops and focus groups. So we had a technical issue with my other virtual workshop. I'm having a, just want to, never want to use Zoom again for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, but we are rescheduling the virtual workshop to a Saturday morning, January 7th. Um, I believe we proposed 10.30 a.m. I'm setting this up as an event that has to be registered for so that we, when we do all the work to re-advertise it, I know what to expect that day. Weston and Sampson is taking the reins on some of the technical issues because I've, I've, I've made a couple, it's just, it's been too complicated. And when we've, we've had the meetings, um, these are unexpected issues that I not, don't discover until we launch the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so we do want to make sure we're providing we folks who haven't. We need to haven't. get that reservation link up <laughs> yeah. soon. Um, we've, we should finalize that tomorrow and it should okay, be up and good. advertised shortly. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, January 7th. We do want to make sure we're providing folks who haven't been able to be there in person the opportunity to, uh, to participate virtually. Uh, given that it's the winter, a Saturday morning didn't seem as, unappe as uh, unappealing as a Saturday morning in the middle of the summer did. So um, that's the date. Um, I will confirm the time once we get the event bright up. And I will also send you the link so you can share it with your friends and colleagues. Um, Looking at the closure of the survey, which is slated as January 6th, unless the board opted to extend it, um, thinking about what comes next. Um, and as, as I've alluded to before, draft vision statement, workshop on proposed actions. Mary, you've, you've to, uh, wanted to see existing conditions chapters again. Um, I want to see the existing condition chapters and the, and the draft takeaways. So what I uh, suggested to Weston and Sampson and what I, what I would be seeking from you is to do all of that um, in either in the second meeting in January, which is the 18th, or if you wanted to hold a unique meeting on this individually the week prior on the 11th of January. To have Weston and Sampson in the room to begin doing that work after the closure of the survey. Oh, I think, I think the 18th is better. Yeah. Yeah. That will give everybody plenty of time. When you say workshop on proposed actions, are you talking about, like, Inviting the public? Yeah. Is that what you're I mean, talking it would be about? a public meeting, really workshopping them with you as the board, but, you know, um, we'd be amenable to public comment as well. Ultimately, no, what we want to do is... I'm sorry. Describe what you mean when you say workshop on proposed actions. What Ultimately, you what we, we, Weston and Sampson and my, my office, would like to do is present to you 
proposed action items in an actual implementation table for your review and consideration and to go over them in consideration of the community engagement activities okay. to make sure that it's so consistent. So you're not, all right, I'm sorry, because when you said workshop, I was like, are you going to invite people in to have them suggest actions? No. You, no. they're, Western we and Samson and you, right. and, okay. propo and propose yep. an implementation plan. Um, and ultimately, with those things, with the vision statement and the implementation plan and the existing conditions, we, we essentially have a draft. So what I would really like to suggest is you allow us to assemble the draft so you can review this in its totality, mm -hmm. as opposed not to individual gonna, I'm sections. not going to let you give us the draft until I see the red line changes to the existing conditions. <laughs> because I worked really hard on those, and it, it started in April. I haven't seen them. I, I so, understand. But, I mean, you can see them with, with the whole else. document. I know, but I've been asking for so long for them. I know. Uh, I'm sorry. It, it feels impractical from the position of my department. So I would ask well, the rest I'm of the I'm feeling like I'm being that. ignored. Not being ignored. If you, what you're suggesting is you put it all in one package. Yes. So we have all the information oh, yes. to digest at once. That's right. I'm fine with that. It to be as soon as possible. <laughs> have they done it? Has Western and Simpson done it? Of course. Okay. So how? So release it to me. I want to see it. So, I mean, the one thing I don't know is do they have track changes, red line drafts? So you always want to see red line drafts, and I don't know what I'm able to provide for you. That it, it's, it's, it's an impractical way for us to, to work. So All right, I'll give you a call. Changes, you I'll give you mean? a call. Sorry, I don't want to, you know. Um, okay. Anything else under local comprehensive plan? Updates? No, that's it. I just want to get you a draft. All right. Uh, affordable workforce housing. Um, oh, did, did anybody from the public have a comment about the LCP? No. Okay. Uh, affordable and workforce housing. No major updates here. Uh, HPP document is being finalized. Council has reviewed and approved it. I need to make some minor updates based on feedback I got from the last affordable housing committee meeting where they want to uh, pursue this as more of a phased approach as opposed to a really comprehensive engagement strategy that I had initially proposed. So what the affordable housing committee wanted to see was um, do phase one, uh, have produce a plan that, that establishes the minimum number of units to be created in any given year uh, that's a DHCD calculation. Once we identify what the updated calculation is, pursue a phase two engagement strategy that looks at the town's pipeline and looks at okay. zoning changes. So the first phase would be get the updated plan done okay. in, in, in the minimum standards for DHCD's requirements. Establish the baseline units, and then my department would facilitate the engagement as I've indicated before. Okay. And regional housing strategy. Did, did we talk about that before? The Cape Cod Commission has started a regional effort to develop a regional housing strategy. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a meeting? Uh, uh, the commission has uh, wanted to meet by this week, but we weren't able to meet that date. So we're looking for the first week in January, and I'm, I'm isolating the, the times with our group. So I'm going to, as chair, I'm going to be attending that meeting. Um, and they had draft. Can anybody attend that meeting? No, well, the, um, the Cape Cod Commission corresponded with the town manager and re requested the town manager identify uh, a group of stakeholders in the housing space. So I, I believe you. it was myself, it was Mary, it was uh, chair of the Affordable Housing Committee, uh, Selectman Col Wyman Colombo, and maybe one other individual that I'm not able to recall. But they have Good. draft sheets for us to look at. I am uh, truthfully uncertain of what they provided. <sighs> All right. So whoever got the original email from them, if it was um, Rodney, there's attachments. There's PDFs attached to it. Can you track those down and share them with um, the planning board? And if they have any comments, I'll bring them. Yes, I can. It's a, it's, um, a lot of demographics, um, but um, I'd like to know what you guys think about it. Okay, so that's the reach. So that's Cape Cod Commission Regional uh, Housing Strategy, Clean Water Initiative. The only thing I'm um, I have to report is that um, the board selectmen have water quality uh, issues on their um, agenda, standing agenda, and there is a um, Chapter 40B being proposed on the banks of Peters Pond, mm. 350 plus units. And um, if you generally look at how the flushes flow, guess what? They're coming our way. The nitrogen loading would be coming our way. Um, so I don't know what the Board of Selectmen did this m 
this week. They were going to uh, prepare a draft. Didn't they write a letter or something? If I recall, they, they, they voted to provide, to write a letter to the town of Sandwich, not to DHCD, but to the town of Sandwich. That essentially mirrors a lot of the town of Sandwich's comments that they included in their letter in response to the Pell uh, to DHCD. Yeah. This, this, you know, cross, this flowing of nitrogen loads cross town boundaries can be pretty significant. That's where the receiving end of those. That's why I was wondering why for the sores, we don't have sandwich and possible all together in one point because yeah. no matter what we do, if sandwich don't do That's nothing right. up on their part, we're still gonna get polluted. I, I, I've been saying this for years. It should be three or four towns together. <laughs> so, yeah, and and in the newspaper today, a Chapter 40B is being proposed on Sandwich Road in Falmouth, 800 units. I didn't hear you, Mayor. 800 units, mm -hmm. an 800 unit, Chapter 40B we is being proposed house. in Falmouth on uh, Sandwich in, Road. Something in addition I'm to sick Peter's house. lawn yep. and the state, Forest no. Dale. Yep. The state, this case, and where, and, 750 and million for it. And I don't, it, no, it's yeah, in Falmouth yeah, on it. Sandwich Road. We're begging for housing. And I don't know where we those don't get flushes. A, like a penny. I understand. That's why I'm saying, you know. <laughs> no, I'm mad that the state just gave 750 million for illegal immigrants to get housing, work, schooling, food. And we don't have no money for housing for the people that live here. Now, I don't understand that. Where did we get that 700? $50 million to build housing and, and send, get jobs for them and everything. And we have veterans that live in the, in the woods. Right. They, they don't even live on the base. And I'm sick of this. We talk about affordable housing for 20, 30 years, because I've been on the board. Yeah. Nothing gets done. And then the state all of a sudden, oh, we have $750 million to help the illegal, illegal immigrants get housing and and it's not well to get old people can't even afford their house and this stuff. I'm, mm. I'm sick of this affordable housing thing because nothing gets done. All they do is talk about it. You know. Doesn't then, happen without money. No, but the, it doesn't happen. And the and the housing. Will the state get the money to help them and not? The housing bill is up for yeah, discussion this yeah, this year. It's, it's like backwards. Okay. Shouldn't have asked. All right. <laughs> I, I don't have. I know. I don't have anything else about clean water initiative. If anybody else well, does. I'll be joined for okay. weeks now. Um, board member committee reports. Cape Cod Commission. I guess the regional housing strategy. Um, Community preservation committee. We're not meeting until the first Thursday in January, and hopefully we'll know more about 751 Main Street um, and finalize our vote on 9 Santuit Lane. Design review. I think I spoke about J. Jill last time, didn't I? No, I think it was a different commons property. Pardon me? I think it was a different location. I can't remember exactly. Well, I don't have my notes with me because I wasn't prepared to speak, but J. Jill is going in across from Panera's. Okay. Oh, yeah. And um, they are totally crazy wild about signs. They've got a sign, <laughs> multiple signs all over. <laughs> Little signs at the corner of the window, and then they've got what they call a blade sign. You know what a blade sign is? Mm -hmm. They've got that listed there. Nobody could possibly mistake this store for anything but J. Jill. <laughs> they do have a sombrella awning, a gray awning, very nice. Uh, it's a big store. It's less than 9,000 square feet, of course, or 9,000, 10,000 square right. feet. Just, just under 10. Right. Yeah, right. whatever. And, um, I think they expect to be in by March or April. Isn't that about right? I think so. Wow. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, Environmental Oversight Committee. No meeting. Historic District Commission. I'm still waiting for I know, meeting. I still need, I was just thinking it. I'll, yeah. I'll, you'll hear from me. Good. Okay. And then we have <laughs> correspondence. I'm confused about invitation to consult on the Be Beacon Wind Project and notification. Of using the national of NEPA process to fulfill, oh, section 106 obligations. I get it. Mm -hmm. They want to reduce the um, the environmental review to a, a NEPA. Yeah. 
I really don't care. Does anybody want to uh, make comment on that? This is the one, the wind farm going yeah. down yeah. toward Montauk Point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this would be a, a different, a, a, um, a, a lesser uh, uh, degree of environmental review. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about it. I don't know enough about it. It's going to be very unsightly. And all the power goes into New York City. <laughs> what? That's what the map shows. They're showing you. They're showing miles. you. They're running a line all the way to uh, Queens. <sighs> yeah, it's going to your neighborhood, old neighborhood. <laughs> oh, well. Okay. Go if there's no other matter, I'd accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 There you aye. go. Have a great holiday, everybody. Yeah. See you after the new year. Yeah. I'd have lost that bet, Chris. Yeah. <laughs>